you plant trees. Yeah. You plant a tree, that invites a bird, it invites a yeah. boat. You know, you plant different crops. You you don't poison. Yeah. You know, that that invites variability. Yeah. I love and that. so and that's where you really gotta trust nature. So um, and you've got to do nothing in a way. You've got to not intervene. You've got to actually trust that whether it's evolution or God or whatever it is you believe um, actually has got us to this point. And if you support that and do all of that right, well, then things will take care of themselves. That was Darren Doherty, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to country, culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series, I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. G'day. This final episode of Season 3 is with Darren Doherty, and it's a ripper. Um, Darren was, has been described by Joel Salatin as the world's best um, hydrologist, and I'm not surprised at all. Darren has a wealth of um, knowledge. I caught up with Darren at uh, Castlemaine, carefully I pronounce that one, Castlemaine in uh, Victoria. We talked about permaculture, his, his um, growing up in Bendigo, his time in, on the pans at many, uh, many restaurants, um, and how that's all culminated into a, a, an amazing advisory and, and consulting business. Um, and those skills he learnt, uh, interestingly enough, on the pans and in retail, um, set him up for a, an amazingly successful um, Regrarian is the name of his business uh, uh, consulting company. But before we slip into the interview with Darren, I um, just want to let you know and remind you about a few um, workshops coming up in the next couple of months on the 17th and 18th of June, where it's um, Hunter Valley at Cringlewood, the amazing biodynamic um, vineyard there. Uh, 19th and 20th, we're up near Delucca between um, between Roma and Miles. Uh, that's in July, and that's with the Hughes family up there. On the 22nd and 23rd of July, we're with um, Mitch and Nina Bray up near Kin Kin on the Sunshine Coast. Um, so I hope you enjoy this interview with Darren Doherty as much as I did. Mate, we're on. Darren? Okay. Darren Doherty. Um, or Doherty. Doherty. Oh, Doherty. Oh, Doherty. Mm. Well, is that uh, Irish, Welsh? Yeah, Irish. Irish. Mm. Don't, Don't be from, calling me a Welshman. That's okay. They're Celts too, but uh, we're from Donegal, which is uh, so the northernmost part of Ireland. There's a, a peninsula called Inishon, which is right at the top, and that's where our clan's from. Is that near, is that near the um, Giant Steps? Isn't it up north in northern Ireland? I think Island? so. I don't know exactly where. I've not been there. I went there years ago on a football tour. A How'd rugby you go? tour. It was great. They broke your nose? No, we busted them. <laughs> we played um, uh, Queen's, Coll- uh, is it Queen's College yeah, yeah, in yeah. there in Belfast. In, du- in Dublin. Oh, is that Dublin? We were in Belfast as well. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the name of the uni there, but it was. Um, no, Trinity. Sorry. It's Trinity. Trinity in, yeah, it would be Queen's. Yeah. It's Queen's in Belfast. Yeah, there's no Queen's in Dublin, as it were. As of, <laughs> they got rid of the monarchy a while ago. <laughs> you might have heard that. <laughs> they did. Well, we did. We were on buses and we had the Aussie flag at the back of the bus. So it was 50 mm-hmm. of, uh, was there 50 of us? No, it wasn't quite that many. 40 or something. That's right. Because we called, well, there was 40 of us mm-hmm. and we had a roll call and I was one and da, 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 you know, being an A. And then the bus driver was 41. So he's, he was, he was, we just called him 41 the whole time. <laughs> hey, 41, where are we going now? <laughs> Anyway, and we turned up with a bus and um, off the ferry mm-hmm. with the Aussie flag on the back and the bus driver didn't know and then we're at the lights in Belfast somewhere or just going into Belfast <clears throat> and we look across and there's a tank, like those oh. wheeled tanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. armoured wow. things and with machine, you know, like a wow. machine gun pointed at the bus and we're just going, okay, what was yeah, that? And then 41's going, get rid of the flag, get rid of the flag. <laughs> It's anyway. got the Union Jack on it. It should be 
it's still there, isn't it? Um, yeah, it was <laughs> still on the flag at this point. Now, Dad, is, is anyone still listening? Um, we better get into this mm, interview because we, we weren't. How did we get on a bowl well, of your name? That's me. That's you, mate. So we um, apologise for a bit of echoing. We are sitting in a room in the, at um, Cream Town, mm. uh, the cafe. Your, um, your cafe restaurant, cafe gallery, restaurant, gallery, arts hub, creatives hub, creative space, mm. um, which we will talk about mm-hmm. and. Um, we we cleaned cleaned a few things out of the room we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, so apologies for it's a little bit echoey. Got some remnants. Got some stuff there. You've got mm-hmm. you've got a. It's pretty much your life right there. Isn't yeah, it, mate? it is. That's Cri- what I cricket thought. bat, some grog, a melon, and a cookbook. Mm-hmm. A rock melon. A so rock that just ties the geology. <laughs> I'm a fan of geology. Well, that's pretty much. Thanks, thanks for the interview, Dad. That was wonderful. Wood. And a bit of wood. And a bit of wood and ironing. And, I, and I'm really good at ironing. Um, <laughs> so it's not just Tony Abbott. It's me. Too. <laughs> So we pretty much summed up Daz's life in, mm-hmm. the, in our background there. Mm-hmm. Mate, we'll just get into it. Um, as discussed, um, the regenerative journey that I like to dig into is about my interviewees' lives, mm-hmm. and um, it's not necessarily based around farming. You know, do, oh, I'm a farmer and I do this and I did that and I've transitioned or whatever. It's about, I mean, everyone has a story, everyone has a, you know, dare I say, a regenerative type of story where they're developing, they're growing, they're... Mm-hmm. they're Pursuing, you know, life purpose, whatever you want to call that, and I suspect you have that as well, mm-hmm. Daz. That's why we're here, mate. Tell, let's start by talking about where we are. Now we're in. Is it Castle Main or Castle Main? How is there? Is well, there there's a there? really good bumper sticker which I always pay attention to. Bumper stickers. Um, in fact. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> there's a really good bumper sticker that gets gets around here, and, and it says that there's no R in castle, um, so that doesn't help. The Novo Castrians, <laughs> Novo Castrians, uh, yeah, but um, yeah, here no, it's Castle Main. Um, it does distinguish one if you say uh, Castle Main. Uh, um, so, <laughs> that? You're enough enough yeah, if you yeah. Castle Main. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You're perhaps from Adelaide. Oh. <laughs> or let's just say that uh, your parents paid for your schooling. Oh, okay, um, cool. Yeah. So um, so that's where we are. Yeah, yeah. we're in Castlemaine, which Castle is Main, a Castle old, Main. as a lot of places here in central Victoria, um, an old goldfields town. So this mm. was the richest alluvial goldfield, and it still is, um, in the world. Um, so there's still mining happening? No, there's, oh, there's a little bit, but um, in terms of the volume that came out, it's still the record. Wow. As far as I understand, and um, and that had a pretty significant impact on the environment here. It's, it's all creeks being alluvial, mm. and Castlemaine's the convergence of two creeks, and uh, they yeah they were all they were basically turned upside down. It so, looks like it. Y- yeah, it's it's come back. Yeah. I mean, nature. We're right on. The, you know, if you think about the um, the savoury brittleness scale. Mm. Um, we're non-brittle here. It's right on the edge of where you grow, where blackberries grow. Yeah. I always look at that as being that sort of indicator. Yeah. And um, yeah, so there's been a lot of regeneration that's occurred over the journey of Castlemaine. Um, yeah, when it was taken over from the Judge Awarong, and, and upon not whose land we stand, we stand, and we chat yeah. about today. Um, it does strike me as being, I mean, like most of Australia, you, there's a sense and my, my, I guess, appreciation and perception of that uh, improves every day is the, you know, you know, beside the road, that's maybe not the best indicator, but certainly the profile, you know, the some erosion, you know, um, creek lines and so on, you know, that profile of soil and what's not on top is, uh, is not, is not um, unique to this no. part of the world. No, know. it's a it's a quartzy loam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is growing some things yeah. here. I mean, I've just come from the further, where was I, south east. Yeah, um, you were over at Monagita. That's all volcanics volcanic, through there, so yeah. relatively recent volcanics. Um, that's actually the easternmost realm of what is the biggest volcanic plain in the world, which goes all the way down to Hamilton. Yeah, so once you get up into the ranges there, that's sort of like the edge of it, mm. and then it goes all the way down to the South Australian border. So, which is how far for our listeners? Oh, I'm going to say four to five hundred k's kilometres. Yeah, that's big, yeah, so about three hundred, two hundred and fifty, three hundred miles. Wow. Yeah, it's a big area. Yeah. So basalt soils. Yeah, and you know when you know, we talk about the journey, like I work a lot overseas, as you know, and um, a lot of people say, well, there's a general narrative that Australia is the oldest continent in the world and all that stuff, and certainly there's places where it is and right here the 
the ground's about 500 million years old. Uh, the mountain that's over there, Lianganook, which is also known as Mount Alexander, um, it's uh, granite and it's about 450 mm. mil. But then you go 10 minutes that way and there's lava flows which are, you know, in the tens or, or hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, right. So you've got that and that's part of that whole system. So so a lot of those old uh, or the newer volcanics, as they're called, um, are new soils. Mm. So, um, And we've got quite a lot of that. And there's pockets of it all the way along the divide. So there are elements of Australia which are young. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you come to our journey here in central Victoria. I mean, our family came here in the 1850s, various branches of my lineage, and um, they're on... They're up north where it's a new alluvium, mm. um, which is all the wash from all of this. Um, the so oldest, the so oldest soil. When you say north, so the wash was going north. Yeah, so all of, so the creeks here flow south and then they go north. So they hit the so there's ranges in here which mm. are at the foothills of the divide, and on the southern side. So all these creeks run south mm. and then they run into a river or rivers, which then run north into oh, the Murray. The Murray, of yeah, course. Right. Okay. <laughs> so um, with the divide being the where all those rivers come from. So yeah, right. so part of my family were out on the northern plains around Kerrang and Swan Hill and all of that, which is right, oh shit, right out on the river there. What's your gear, so, mate? Yeah, I know. It's bloody flash gear too, mate. <laughs> um, anyway, they're out there and then around the gold fields of Bendigo, yep. and which is where I mainly hail from. And then, um, yeah, a bit, so we've got all of that around here. And we're sitting in Crame Town, um, which is this? The, is this the first um, uh, retail sort of situation you've really been part no, of? No, no. So I, um, when I left high school in what was that nineteen eighty? I did. I did HSC. I did. I, I completed HSC, but I didn't pass. Is that Victorian or New South yeah, Wales? Yeah, Victorian. Oh, they called HSC. Yeah, then yeah, too. yeah. It's right. VCE now. Yeah. So I, 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 um, I think I attended thirty-seven percent of classes. I think it was the the year level <laughs> coordinator told me, um, and uh, I became very familiar with the adjacent park and the Albert Hotel, and. Um, <laughs> And, and in, what, uh, in, what, in what town are we? Uh, Bendigo, yeah, Bendy. in Bendigo, and then they call it uh, Bendy. Is that, is that a name? Benders? Benders, <laughs> Benders. <laughs> Go for a bender of Benders. Yeah, a yeah, lot right. of bend, a lot of bending going on there. <laughs> um, yeah, ben, Bendigo had three hundred and fifty pubs or something at one stage. People used to go on a pub crawl, and it was a really bad idea. Oh, like even even David call. Boone couldn't pass that test. Yeah, right. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I gr- went to school there, and then the next year I went up to Cairns. I left home and went up with a few mates up there and um, did a bit of work, not much. I was pretty well just getting stoned and not doing much up there, as you do at that age. <laughs> well, I did anyway, and then um, came back home, and then I got a job um, with a old mate, her primary school mate's brother. Um, he owned a restaurant out here, um, which was a hatted restaurant um, called the Eagle Hawk, and I started working on the floor there as a waiter, and that's about 1986. Mm. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, I did HSC in '85, and then um, what we uh, and. And the his wife, uh, the late great Janine Canolan, she said to me on day one, she was awfully charming. That I mean, the the classic female, powerful, p- powerful female matre d'. Mm. She's about I'm going to say twenty years older than me. Mm. Um, she said to, she was so charming. She said, "I might be charming today, but I'll be the bitch of your life." <laughs> <laughs> you will welcome. Hate, you will hate me. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome. And she was right, um, but yeah. she was amazing. I actually saw her years later. I was up in Byron, and I saw her up there. I was Lisa took me into a clothes shop or whatever, and there was Janine. And I walked no up way. to her and I said, "How are you, Janine?" And we hugged and everything. I said, "I just want to thank you. You're fucking amazing. You're the bitch of my life." However, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yes, because uh, we we're talking about you know behaviours before and the way that people are and sometimes you need it like I often say to people here you know not every conversation you ever have has to be agreeable yeah. it's important to have disagreeable conversations and exactly. so much of what happens is that doesn't happen and so everyone's happy 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 and then you get one little moment and then the whole you know, house of cards fall down mm-hmm. so 
So she didn't operate that way and that was helpful. So I did that hospo thing. I then went to down to Tasmania and worked down there. I, I think, I, yeah, I went up to Queensland as well up to, I worked on uh, Green Island. I was a chef and um, a matra d there and then went down to Ta- Tasmania and I worked, um, opened an um, international hotel down there in Launceston. Some bloke made a billion dollars or whatever and thought he'd make a hotel so he made this spent 40 million bucks or something Robert Hoskin I don't know where he is these days but anyway and did this fine dining and it was like super fine dining so I was a chef there on there we did six months of training so I cooked at tables in the mm. full oh really yeah turkey oh, what do they call it monkey suit um, tuxedo, tuxedo every oh, you, night. You came out with the, tro- the flaming trolley of something. Yeah, 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 out yeah. And... Oh, mate, it was so, it was the best job I ever had. It was. Were well, so you the, the originator of that salt thing? And the, no, the oil, no, no. Was I look at that. that no, 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 no. I look at people doing that. That's not. No, you do. That's a back of house thing. That's not a front of house <laughs> thing. No, no, no. we It's much more. Like, yeah. yeah. Sorry. It's much more this, and it's voilas. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Did it's you have? Not, this, it's not did, like this weird you, sort of um, <laughs> reptilian <laughs> sort of thing. I don't get it. Did you have those silver hoods, or you went? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we used to do that, and so we had. Uh, so that was a forty-four seat restaurant, mm. and it had eleven floor staff. So it had what's called the full departy system. Wow. So the departy system is like a military system, which is appropriated into hospo. Yeah, right. So it's a, it's got there's a full hierarchy and there's rankings and all of that with the executive chef, the head of the whole thing, and then Matra D in fr- charge of front of house and the sommelier, sommelier and the chef de rang, which is the chef of the range, and then the commie de rang. And there's a whole hierarchy, which again, you know, when you talk about the journey, so much of what we're, yeah, that, so much of what we talk about now is sort of anti hierarchical, mm-hmm. and I, knowing how that works, it works. Yeah. Just like bees don't bugarise around with this stuff. They just go, yeah. there's a hierarchy. Thank you. There's a, there's I didn't a ask to be born the queen, you know. But I know what I've got to do. <laughs> I know what I've got to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I get that. Um, so, yeah, so that's been really helpful in the journey. And um, But as, as, a, as, a, as a, like a bit of a training ground. For well, yeah, that and systems, mm-hmm. working with people. One of the great things that I learned in hospital, which I talk about with people um, in my work in agriculture, is... For that job when we did training, which most people in hospo don't get trained, especially mm. front of house people, back of house people, you know, they do an apprenticeship and whatnot. Most people front of house don't, but we did. And one of the things we learned about was the psychology of selling and the psychology of the guest experience. And the guest experience, it was called control dimension. So when you go to a table... Controlled c- dimension. dimension. So dimension. you would go to a table and you'd immediately assess the mood, the temper of the, of that couple or mm. that table or whatever, and then because your you, your objectives were two things: one was to make sure that their experience was as wonderful as it could be, and two to get one hundred and twenty dollars out of each one of them, right? So <laughs> that in nineteen eighty seven or eight, right? Yeah, so it was right. a pretty expensive joint, right? Yeah, right. So yeah, it was one hundred and fifty or whatever it was. But anyway, that they were the two things that you had to do, mm. and so. That was really interesting because as a person who then became a consultant ultimately so, um, or so working good. in extension and doing training and all of that, a lot of the time I'm assessing people's temper and mood. So there was a lot of that. And Lisa, my wife, often says that it would be useful if a lot of people spent some time in hospitality because you learn so damn much about how to that. be with people. You know, Joel Salatin talks about a lot of farmers um, wanting to – they're, they're happiest just living in their humidity crib of a tractor um, and listening to Charlie Pride or whatever. But um, <laughs> I think it's got better than that, hasn't it? <laughs> oh, sorry, listening to Charlie Arnott <laughs> interviews. Um, <laughs> That's it. But, you know, a lot of people, um, because they don't get out and about and have a, a broader journey, it's almost like Abraham said, or yeah. his old man said, Abraham's yeah. old man, I can't remember his name, said, get out. Bugger off, yeah, mate. Go yeah. and have a journey. Yeah. Come back. Come back when you're ready. It's a good point, Daz, because, I mean, in t- two, two different um, anecdotes, I guess, um, I'll throw on the table. One is when I left uni, I did four years of rural science at Armidale up at um, UNE and, UNA and, uh, and uh, New South Wales, yep. New England up there, and sort of knew what I wanted to do, wanted to go farming, wanted to get home, and mum said, why don't you go and work in a pub for two years in Sydney, hmm. which I did. And I worked at Lord Dudley there with mm-hmm. Jamie Couchet, the governor, mm-hmm. and 
and I've I've said it before and I'll say it again, it was the best two years for that very reason, mm-hmm. one of the reasons. Working hospitality, dealing with people. Um, I was a gla- I started as a glassy, so you mm-hmm. are in the thick of it. Mm-hmm. You know, you're the you're the last on the rung pretty it's good much. Good for the footy too, because you learn how to dodge. Totally. And, yeah. and juggle yeah. and hot yeah. and, and ting. And hip and shoulder. That's that's <laughs> it. I mean that, 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 you know, mm-hmm. slipping through a crowd when you've got you're holding a hundred plus glasses. It takes a bit of skill. So yeah. there was that. And then there when, when I was managing and working on the bar, it was nice to have that that buffer of the bar. Mm-hmm. You felt like you were in control and you you were, you know, running the show, but but absolutely gauging the mood and giving them what they want, but then giving them more. Um, and you know, having an appreciation and managing people's behaviours that Oh, especially when alcohol's in oh, totally, too, yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. And the other one is farming. You know, I know a lot of people who school, straight home, stayed at home, 10 years, cracked the shits, dad's going, we, we are wondering why their son or their daughter is, is more, more, more sons, I guess. Why to, there's dysfunction. Why there's dysfunction, why they're unhappy, they piss off. But if they'd said, you know, I guess like my mum had, mm-hmm. you know, go and work mm-hmm. in a pub or somewhere else, go out, work it out, create some new reference points and then come back and mm-hmm. then you'll be, you'll be much, much better off. So... Um, yeah, I t- totally agree. It, 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 there's there's no better place to to understand and appreciate social interaction. Well, Cato yeah. said in De Agricultura, which was written two thousand years ago, he said something similar. He said, "Go," because that book was about um, returning uh, Roman soldiers or legions, and it more or less said. Don't come back and buy your little farm, mm. which they would often get. Was sort of like the first soldier settlement scheme. Yeah, right. Um, and They're quite progressive, those. Yeah, Romans, yeah that's right. Don't <laughs> don't come back and get your hundred igera, mm. um, which is about eighty acres, until you've sown your wild oats and you've fought all your wars, yeah. and you'll be about thirty five, thirty six. You're in the right zone. Yeah, good one. So it's nothing new, but yeah, the retail thing I think is really helpful. Uh, you know. <sighs> Life, life for most people these days is not one profession, um, even in agriculture. And one of the things that anyone in agriculture would appreciate is that if you're a full-time agriculturalist, then you are many things. It's the most diverse profession that there is in terms of your, your requisite skill base, mm-hmm. um, especially if you're also interacting with the public, uh, like so many people are, are now doing, because... You know, the terms of trade in agriculture are so appalling, so it's any wonder that people would try and look, you know, lift the lid on the opportunity of value adding or, you know, doing direct marketing and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, again, you're adding these this range of skills which have got to come from scum, somewhere. And if they don't come from some outside experience, like your mum was um, wise enough to provide for you or just me by the just by you know just the way it landed, mm. um, then that might that that lack of experience can can find you wanting, or it really means that you've got to find someone and then pay someone, or split it some with someone else mm. to be able to manage that. So, yeah. and all farmers have stories to tell, don't they? You know, which is that is the the hidden gem, or it doesn't have to be hidden, but that's you know their day to day life is generally quite interesting. From for, oh yeah, for those yeah, that yeah. Don't I know, mean, a great yeah. great environment to work in, and you know, hopefully that is the case. I mean, some farms these days don't have a great environment mm. um, for a variety of reasons, but uh, yeah, there's a sky. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, you're you're in a there's no windows mm. um, largely, so so being able to interact with. Uh, well, I mean, even the whole concept of a uh, of a farmer having clients or customers, because back in that's the- relatively well, it's 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 I, it's, it's novel. It's uh, become novel, yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, especially in the industrial era. But I mean, if you were a, a Parisian market gardener, well, then that's not the case. That's wrong. Um, so yeah, it does depend on the production system. But yeah, the retail thing is. Um, after I did that, um, I got the shits with Hospo after a while because, you know, you, I was doing a lot of split shifts and split shifts are, are just not healthy. They're a real young person's game. And so split the, being your... Well, you're you working, do you're doing a morning, you're doing yeah. a morning shift yep. or morning lunch. So you're serving lunch and then you're doing dinner. Yeah, right. With, so you'll with, have a little break in the Arvo. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you go off and, in my case, go off and have a couple of big cigarettes and um, or whatever else, like everyone else. Go to the. Well, I was working. <laughs> like in, everyone. Else. I was working at in St Kilda at Jean Jacques by the Sea for a while there, and we'd go off to the Espy 
Uh, um, oh yeah, <laughs> and have a few, have a few, have a few, have a few, have a few um, pints or or <laughs> pots as we have down with Adam Schooners down here, mate, um, and uh, <laughs> and a few big cigarettes, and, 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 then, and then get back to pipe, using so. knives and shit um, and hot pants, yeah, <laughs> and then do that until you know eleven, twelve o'clock, and yeah. then roll back up. It's it's a hard life, yeah, um, and so I. I you know, I want to play footy. You, like you want to play sport. I've always played sport and um, all the rest of it. And you just can't do that. You can't catch it with friends or mm. whatever. And so anyway, I came back home to Bendigo, and um, I, I well, when I was in when I was in Launceston, I um, Launceston is in northern Tasmania is a what what I would call one of the epicenters of organic production in mm. Australia yeah. and in the world, therefore. Mm. And there's yeah, it's quite a little food bowl. Again, it's new volcanic soils. Just it's 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 one of those places of the necessary bio wealth to support more easily organic or biodynamic production. So we would have a lot of different um, producers who would come um, to the to the restaurant as our suppliers, um, just as we do here. And so, having grown up on a farm outside of Bendigo, um, you know the sort of farm genie sort of clicked in because I had something to converse with, whereas yeah. most of the other kids or young fellas or people that were working there had come from town. So I had something to... And that yeah, was that was really this. the start of my consulting career in a sense yeah. because I became interested in, oh, how are you producing this and da 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 So, so when I came back to, and the whole organic things, I hadn't really thought about organics or biodynamics at that, up to that point in my life. Um, I mean, our farm was just a farm. Um, it yeah, we just we it was it was organic by neglect, I might say. Okay. Um, so we uh, so I came back to Bendigo and I started to, by that stage. I was sort of um, oh, a mate of mine, Peter Crutchfield, who's since passed. He gave me a copy of the One Straw Revolution, which I'd read, and I'd moved back to the family farm with my elderly grandparents, and I was helping them. And at the same time as I'd read Fukuoka, so I'd sort of. So that you know, when you talk about turning points and mm. big, um, yeah, it, that reading that book wow. was yeah. amazing. I remember, grand, I, I built the most beautiful garden, and even my uncles came out and said, "Wow, this is a beautiful garden!" Like it was just mm. stunning in the middle of summer. It was. And your age, what? Oh, twenty. Yeah. Okay. Nineteen twenty. Yeah, yeah. thereabouts. Yeah. And um, yeah, built this kick-ass garden. Um, in my nana's, because my nana's, like a lot of farms, always had the garden in the same spot, and she let me take it over. And you know, you got all the bits. You got plenty of just plenty of sheep, cow manure, mm-hmm. lots of compost, yep. lots of wood, blah blah blah. Put it all together, straws, you know, all the rest of it. So yeah, off it went. And I remember one day I was in there. I read. I read. There was part of it. Uh, I think it was his second book that I read. Um, it had this thing about the philosophy of moo. And Moo was <laughs> well. Moo, <laughs> anyone listening would know better than me. Um, it was sort of like this do nothing philosophy. Moo, Moo as in M W O M U M U M U. Yeah, Moo. Oh, so it's okay. Japanese. Yeah, right? yeah. Anyway, which is just chill. And, and you know, by that stage, I'm still doing the big cigarettes and all that. So it's um, it's uh, it's. Moves, move works. <laughs> move. Was, you were going. I can do this move. Yeah, stuff. I can. I can do no dig gardening, and I can do nothing. <laughs> so that works really well. <laughs> so I remember like I was lying in my way. garden, imagining, you know, as you do, probably had a big cigarette, and I'm lying there going, "Well, this doing nothing stuff's really cool." <laughs> and my granddad came in and kicked me out the ass and said, "We don't do that around here. <laughs> we don't do move around we here. We don't buddy. do move." But <laughs> moo actually meant something much more elegant, of course. Yeah. Um, and that was doing nothing is actually don't intervene. Yeah. Like the late Paul Taylor, his great brand, uh, his uh, his company, his biofertiliser organic uh, consultancy was Trust Nature. And mm. that's a perhaps a, a variation on the do nothing thing. Sometimes you've got to – and I was, uh, you, you know Michael Crawford, Dr. Michael Crawford? Uh, soil, oh, yes. soil CRC. Yeah, 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 exec- yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely, he's a, lovely he's a, he, yeah, he's been a friend of ours for yeah. thirty years. Anyway, I was talking to him the other night, and because um, we had dinner and uh, talking about all that, and I said, well, you know, the great success of industrial agriculture has been that it's sifted out all of the variables, such that it's really successful at doing at producing something with not very much. Like it's it's amazing. 
what we can do, how many people we can feed in the world. You know, a lot of people in organics or permaculture or whatever else, are, you know, they're always kicking the kicking the foot, in, you know, the, putting the boot into industrial ag, but the reality is it feeds the world. I and it uses guess. a lot of inputs and, you know, we all understand that, but it actually does it. It's, and it's it, created efficiencies of, of such. Yeah, of, of a kind. Yeah, of a kind, you, yeah. You, know, you start scratching it and it's a bit shitty, yeah. but... But it's amazing, and but it's done that by eliminating so many variables. Mm. Whereas the organic regenerative, whatever you want to call it, the la la producers, um, like you, <laughs> <laughs> super, how, how rude! I, I think you're super la la. Um, <laughs> Mate, I'm but, blue. Yeah, I'm blue. Your blue. Now, oh, no, I don't I'm know blue. about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But what you I'm invite, you know, you plant trees. Yeah. You plant a tree, that invites a bird, it invites a yeah. bug. You know, you plant different crops. You you don't poison. Yeah. You know, that that invites variability. Yeah, I love And that. so and that's where you really gotta trust nature. So um, and you've got to do nothing in a way. You've got to not intervene. You've got to actually trust that whether it's evolution or God or whatever it is you believe. Um, actually has got us to this point. And if you support that and do all of that right, well, then things will take care of themselves. And, well, you know, with a little bit of help. Totally. Right? And that's... So that was quite profound to have all of that from um, Fukuoka. And uh, so I have a have a him to thank. And so I did all of that and I got a job um, then at the Organic Green Grocer in Bendigo with Dennis and Mary and the late Dennis James, who was still... Fr- oh, Dennis died a couple of years ago, but Mary's still... A good friend and um so i managed their organic shop mm. and that was the next stage in this evolution um of having this because i was a food buyer because and, and now i'm in the other epicenter of or another epicenter of organic biodynamic production which is here in central victoria yeah so a lot of the uh, pioneers people like ian lloyd would come down every every month to from naya and he, Ian Lloyd was one of the breakaway people from Podolinsky um, in that he, he and... Or, so I got, you know, it was like a gossip centre on... Because they'd all come in. <laughs> and it's kind of like my life now in a way. So much gossip. <laughs> <laughs> you love so, gossip. Yeah. I don't know. What we call the magazine? It's not new idea. That's already taken. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Moo idea. Yeah, yeah. We'll just call it Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, we want people to buy it, okay? Well, yes. it's Oprah, there's Charlie. You can have, you know, oh, isn't that where it's all going? Opera. When the, when the, when my stepchildren were, were young, just a quick segue, they, um, there's, the, there's the opera house in, in Sydney and they thought it was the Opera house and they thought she lived in there. She, lived in, she lives in that big shell in the harbour. Mm, well, the opera house. Of the hair. It was <laughs> yeah, there's different, different there's connotations there. Um, um, yeah, so that was amazing because very quickly you go past the conversation of, you know, here's your juice or here, you know, some, a farmer bringing in their stuff to mm. then going, well, how was that grown? Mm. And then them going, hey, I see you're getting so-and-sos. How are they doing that? And that was really the start of the true start of my consulting career or extension conversation career because so much of my job um, now is about facilitating conversations Mm. and connecting people. And so when I was doing that, like I'd have, say, a uh, person who was a spud grower down down around um, the central highlands here and I'd have another one. Yeah. And I'd go out to their farm one day and then I'd go to the other one. Mm. And those two blokes wouldn't speak, right? Because they knew each other or they didn't they, know they, Well, they, everyone knows each other. But it's more like I'm doing my shit, you're doing yours. Like yeah, they're just busy. Competition? Oh, a bit of that. Yeah. But, you know, and they'd say, well, how's what's he doing? What's their regime mm. or what's she doing? Whatever mm. it was. But so there was a lot of that. Yeah. And um, I wasn't – I mean, obviously there's – commercial confidences and I understand and respect all of that but a lot of the time it wasn't and I was just trying to I suppose um, to borrow um, Aldo Leopold's uh, uh, title, you know the land ethic is really strong with me Mm. you know if I pair everything back in terms of the core motivation it's really um, the land and it's protection and so and I feel that um, organic biodynamic Blah blah blah. 
stuff that doesn't involve novel chemistry that the world has never been familiar with. Yeah. Um, or our bodies, is, or our bodies, yeah, or our bodies, etc. Yeah. And when you understand that, you know, you can go down a huge amount of rabbit holes. Electricity, the whole bloody box and dice, mm. but trying to keep it <laughs> somewhat real. <laughs> um, it's it's like for me, my biggest core motivation is um, is is land mm. um, and its protection and 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 by protection meaning um, that it can get better because yeah. you can't you can't protect something unless it can protect itself yeah um and that's about inviting the diversity and inviting the vari- variables and so on so, so, just on so that that's th- all that's that's where all that sort of started and then yeah. i started to get jobs from from people yeah right they said oh can you come out and i go oh okay and okay. what we charge for that or i'll give you a, i'll give you a lamb roast or whatever a bottle of wine or whatever and soon stop taking that payment <laughs> And on we went. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a that's a great role to be playing. I guess you're in the middle of that. You're in you're in the part of this this not the system, but the, I guess the the flow of food and and and, mm. and transaction and transparency from growing your own in your in your in your grandmother's veggie mm. garden, mm. understanding that end of the the process. Mm. You already you've already dealt with clients, customers in the restaurant world, and now you're in a retail situation where you've got people buying food. So, so what's and you are absolutely a facilitator of conversation and mm, information. Mm, mm. What's the and and now essentially that's your role. What's the mm. what makes a good facilitator mm. in 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 the context of what you? Oh, in the context, yeah. Well, so if you ask that of a like, if I was to hire a facilitator, well, then there's there's classic rules to that. You know, someone who probably doesn't know too much about the topic is certainly not affiliated yeah. with any of the participants in a in whatever the facilitated session was. So I get that. But I think that there's another role for facilitation, which is perhaps what I do. And I'll facilitate, for example, um, a conversation between um, a husband and a wife. Mm. Um, when I go to their, you know, back in the day when I've done, um, you know, you go and do a consult, you turn up, you're at a table, it's another table, right? Yeah. Um, are they at my restaurant or are they at my farming consultancy? I'm immediately... Same, same deal. Well, you know... Like I've often said to people, sorry, no, um, I've often said to people, it's a hard one because you're all, it's, it's Joel, Joel Sallett and I were talking about this, well, his mother actually, she said, you know, when you're in a position of judgment all of the time, and she's a very religious woman, she said, you know, it's, there's only one judge and you say, so you've got to be careful at that, that you get a bit too smart mm. um, and the hubris sort of enters into it. Because judge not lest ye be judged, right? So, which I completely agree with. And so you've got to always keep a lid on your own um, power. Well, power. Yeah. Because you are in a power position. So coming into that, so I probably prefer the term assessment. Yeah. So when I drive into someone's driveway, I'm a very, I've, I've got a photographic memory and I can, you know, I'll go down. I've, I've got a, a, a high observa- I'm high on mm. observation, mm. so I'll go into someone's place, and it's whether it's immediately assessing the land shape um, and what it can do, um, what its climate is. Like, there's so many different clues that you can get when you're reading a space. Mm. Um, to then also seeing how much money they've spent so far what kind you know what sort of fiscal managers are they um, are they accumulators mm. um, of carbon or of junk um, farm junk you know there's all of that it's it's a terrible thing to do in a way but you've got to do it in a way that's it's due diligence isn't it well it's sort of I think about it a lot it's it's sort um, but I don't articulate it enough um, it's you're making, you're sort of creating the frame. Again, it's it's, it's the table, mm. except it's their table, not my table. When they come into a restaurant, it's all ours. Yeah, you've come into my room. Here's this table. It's just you two. Mm. Our cutlery, mm. da 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 da. Right. Mm. It's just you two. But when you go into someone's property mm. or place, and then you walk in, it's all them. It's their expression. Or if they're new to it, then it's the expression of the person before them. Yeah, sure. And so that. Um, then helps you with understand well where are we going to go from here. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at as often I say today within our Regrarians platform context, I'll say well 
what's the landscape context, what's the enterprise context, and what's the human context that we're dealing with, and how do we pull all of that together? And so when I arrive, I'm sort of, you know, my whatever algorithms, logarithms, whatever they're called, are sort of going wild. And then when I say hello, Mm. who makes the cup of tea? Yeah. And, you know, what's the relationship? There's so much psychology in this, um, in the space, um, which I didn't, I d- definitely didn't appreciate until much later. Um, and you didn't appreciate your, your grounding in that? Given oh, because I, no, I, mean, I had no training in psychology or whatever, and I've had to sort of, you but, know, but you had that, that. You had that um, uh, inadvertent training in retail in the restaurant anyway, though. Yeah, in service. In service. Yeah. yeah right. So... So that, that's where I was getting to before. Yeah. That that definitely helped because there was an outcome and that's ultimately happiness, right? Yeah. Happiness to pay money. So there's a value proposition there mm. on whatever um, case. Mm. Like a, a happiness that if I'm giving you advice about how you might plan your farm, well, then you've got to be happy with that. Mm. So yeah. um, there's that. But then that, 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 that advice is going to also lead to the fulfilment of my context, which is, land repair and all of the rest of it, So, which is usually why someone's asked me in the first place. So, so in terms of the facilitator part, it's about being able to listen sufficiently, sum the whole thing up enough, and then sometimes just cut to the chase because the clock's ticking mm. um, and people often just want to get going. I mean, a lot of – and that's, a, that's another thing that I've had to learn, I suppose – So if I look at the first half of my farm planning career, it was mostly design and development. And so... External, as in landscape design development. Yeah. So I'd go, like, I'd go to your farm, you'd hire me to come and you'd know that I had, uh, I'd come and design it for you, Mm. right? You'd not be a really big part of that, kind of like an architect typically, if you hire an architect, basically their house not mm-hmm. your house they'll listen to you but it's basically you hire them for their house yes good um, yeah. yep um, and then so I'd do that and then um, I'd do that within the whole frame of context and then I had my own tree planting teams and fencing teams and earth moving teams and we'd go and basically do a you know, a giant backyard blitz do the job yeah. yeah and you'd be a lot poorer as a result so <laughs> <laughs> so what about so we do that? Yeah, and f- from the perspective of that kind of relationship, um, the facilitation part of it in the, at that time was really to our own end. You know, it's almost a negotiation, not a facilitation. Well, it was really. I look at that time as where um, it was again like the architect. It was my context being kind of imposed on mm-hmm. you, so I could take you a lot of properties which we've completely developed. Um, including some down where you've just been. Mm. And they're amazing. I mean, there's all the trees and the fencing and the driveways and the dams, you know, all the bits. But it's actually me that did that, not yeah. not them, right? So they just agreed to it, right? And by and large, as I understand it, they really love it. But yeah. where – so – in that phase, I was looking at having a big, what I call a big M management, uh, uh, sorry, a big M, a big D development type of approach as opposed to a small, uh, as opposed to a big M management approach. Yeah. And that's the way I frame it now is that a lot of, say, for the second half of my farm planning career is sort of shifted over more to understanding that in most cases it's management that needs to be at the, at the front end of all of this, not development. Mm especially for people who are new to land and they've got, you know, they've sold, the, you know, especially ones who've sold a property in town and, you know, have bought a block and they're, you know, they've got dollars. They're, they're green. They got, yeah, they're, well, they're greeners and they're enthusiastic. God help them if they've gone to any of the produce stores or whatever because they, I can tell immediately again, you know, whether they've gone there first. Mm. Like if they've gone there first, it's you can tell just by the fence post spacing and whether they've got concrete troughs and they've you know they've got seven different implements and a da 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 da, da mm. who they've talked to, yeah, or whether they've gone to a field day, yeah, and like it's just all oh wow this is amazing what can I buy I've got four hundred grand because yep. I've sold my place in town I've got equity I've got to have a red a red tractor to be a farmer and I've got to have a all that yeah. stuff yeah. and so. You front end, so sometimes you're going in, and one of the one of the strongest things that I do now in terms of my facilitation, using my power because I understand I have power, mm. is saying, "Hey, 
Maybe you don't need to do that shit. Mm. Maybe you could actually just take some time and use, again, some Fukuokan advice, do nothing, Yeah. pay attention to how the land is um, because now you're the designer, now you're the planner. And so I'm facilitating that to have more of a what I call a big M management approach mm. and a smaller D um, development, development approach. approach. And then that, that means they're not spending a lot of money, yeah. they're not overheating, and they're not getting to the point where, because a lot of people when they move, and this is again part of the journey, is when they move to land, um, they're real, the phase is really high on infatuation and on innovation. And if as anybody uh, who's been in business for, for any enduring period would know that you can't have too much innovation because mm. otherwise there's too much chaos because innovation inv- invariably... Requires there'll, there'll management a, and well, you'll get just lots of failures. Yeah, when you innovate, there'll be things that go wrong, and if you have too much of that dominating your life, then your life's got too much chaos. Mm. And a lot of that early space in the transition um, has that, whether it's with an existing farmer who's or agriculturalist who's transitioning over to a different method. We want to do it really incrementally. And I say, you know, be incremental, pragmatic and progressive in this. You know, just just take your time because you're not going anywhere. Let's just do it responsibly so that you don't kill yourself, kill your relationship. Because it is a big, you know, you've had a stasis. Now we're about to put you through a pulse. But let's not the, make the pulse too disruptive Yeah. because you may not be able to handle it. Your relationships may not be able to handle it and your business may not be able to handle it. So there's... So when we're facilitating, you know, um, there's a lot of that thinking that goes into it. And some people, and this is what I largely find, most people are not built for that. Um, But they they often do it anyway because of various factors. The infatuation factor is a really big one. Well, you know, when you fall in love, you you fall in love. You do, you're a different person. And that's the same with land. You know, you fall in love, you with your family, it's like so much Mm. going on. Just, just take a chill pill. It's a great point, Daz, because, um, you know, the – and, I, and, I, and I just, again, refer to my own uh, experience. Sure. When 15, 16 years ago did grazing for profit as a sort of a holistic management um, education mm-hmm. phase and learnt about um, managed grazing, um, the government was handing out a whole lot of money to fence and for water and wire. Mm-hmm. I got a fair bit of dough to do that. Uh, went into it. Um, the development, that's the big D, a lot of water and wire, um, thinking this is what I need to do. Which if you're going to do something, that's not the worst thing that you can do? No. No, no that's right. It was, it was For me, it was stepping in the right direction because yep. it was changing from a set stock to this sort of style. Yep. The point is... It's that, facilitating management, actually. Well, it, it is. because yeah. Well, it, this is my thing. It required management of that the development, that infrastructure, which I didn't have. I didn't have the management mm-hmm. skills. I didn't have the experience. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I went out with a whole lot of money, public money, essentially from government, put this stuff in, didn't know how to use it, Some had some really, really tops disasters, not disasters, but just failings yeah. and, and, mm-hmm. le- and learnings, mm-hmm. thankfully. Um, and so, you know, I mean, sometimes the best way to learn how to manage something is just get in and use it and make the mistakes and make the cuts and the bruises and, and that sort of thing. But I guess in, in, a, in a facilitated way, it, I totally get the sense in, I guess, your role as a assessor of the management potential of the people that you're now saying, well, we can put a dam here and some fencing here, like that as, a, as an order of service because you could just go and give them a blueprint and go do this. But if you walk away... And they're going, oh, wow, that's, we're so, you know, we love this. It looks amazing. And then they look at each other and go, actually, how the hell are we going to manage this thing? Yeah, well, that's what, right. Where, how do we run cattle or sheep through this? Or how do we, you know, just R&M on, on stuff can be, um, and that really can take the shine off things, I guess, too, you know. Yeah, yeah, going, absolutely. Hey, Darren, like, oh, that, never, that never happened. <laughs> but I mean, it was what, what? What was the what was the catalyst for changing from going from going in there with a the big D to going in holistic there management? Big... Yeah, okay. Yeah. So when you talk about turning points, it's interesting because I've often reflected on this. 
I went to a barbecue with a mate. Oh, we went over and played some footy. Um, I played in the seconds. Now, when you're talking footy, we're talking Australian. Yeah, the the game where you actually use your feet to kick a ball <laughs> um, with skill, not just some weird <laughs> around uh, yeah, sort yeah. of. Any Campese, Campese is the only person I've been able to see who can actually kick a ball. But um, <laughs> oh, anyway, let's not go there. I know that's a good reference point. <laughs> he was a legend. Well, he did play Aussie rules to start with. Is that right? I, yeah, that's how he. That's how he was such a good kick. Yeah, right. He yeah. was a legend. Yeah, although those rounder Please. balls are a bit harder to kick too. Those ra- oh, ours are a bit more round, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. So anyway, um, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Two men talking. We're going to get into sports somewhere here. <laughs> anyway, um, went over and I, I played a few because I'd stopped playing footy by oh, I don't know. Well, I stopped playing footy, you know, in an organised fashion. I had a mate say, "Oh, we're a bit short in the seconds, so can you come over?" And I. I played, um, I think it was for Sonata or whatever, and played in the, in the Scraggers and um, I think under the pseudonym of Ballbag. Um, and I don't know how. Um, you were registered, <laughs> registered player. I think it was part of the, um, the pre-game inspection. Um, <laughs> Mr. Bag. <laughs> so it was just ball, you know. <laughs> ball or bag when they yelled my name. Anyway, um, we played our game and then we went for a barbecue after the game. And there was a bloke you might know by the name of George King. Oh, yeah. Yep. And George, George. Is, uh, George, I think, is about our vintage. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, um, he was there and we were there with some other mates who were farmers and blah, blah, So we're in Victoria, right? Yeah, we're in yeah. Victoria. Yeah. Sonata's yeah. about an hour west of here. Yeah. It's right on the edge of the Wimmera. Okay, cool. Anyway, um, so George is there at this barbie and he's just done his – this is like 1994 or something. Sure. And – George has just done a holistic management course with Bruce Ward or Alan Savory or blah, blah, blah. And he's, you know, 22, 23, 24, he's like pumped. me. He's pumped. Yeah. I've just done a permaculture course. So I'm all permaculture. He's all holistic management. And we're at a barbecue and we're drinking. And you're, yeah. and you're yeah. at each other. And we're at each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> My permaculture is better than your holistic <laughs> yeah. management, you know, so, and, and vice versa. Yeah. Right. And I've not seen George again, but it's really interesting because. There was that moment, and then there was another moment in 95, I think it was the year after, I went up and did a PDC, a permaculture design course with Bill Mollison, oh, yeah. the late Bill, who I knew very well. And um, anyway, and that was the first time I went and met the great man, and it was up at his farm in northern New South Wales, uh, Ty Elgin. He had a farm up there, oh, sort right. of a permaculture fantasy land. Yeah, right. Anyway, he um, set that up and poured huge amounts of money into it. Anyway, um, and I was there with about seventy five other people, and I went. I was in the. I was in the his library. Bill, Bill had the most exceptional library, private library, and it was all in hoop pine. I think yeah, yeah hoop pine yeah. cabinets. Yeah, so wow. he had all these glass fronted cabinets, and it was an amazing. Took about four rooms up. Mm. Anyway, I was there one day, and he's standing by me, and I pulled out a book called Holistic Resource Management. This is the year after I met George. And he said, put that away, that's destroying Africa. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, went, oh, oh, I've told Alan this, Alan so mm. He thought it was pretty funny. Anyway, <laughs> anyway so I just... But Bill, but Bill had a copy of it. Bill to, had a copy of it. Just to remind yeah, 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 yeah. And Bill and Alan have met... Anyway, it's, 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 I'll talk about this later, but... Yeah. Um, Anyway, so I put it away. And this is what, this is the thing, you know, um, so much, or maybe I'll lift a lid on this a bit, so much mm. of this space is built on demigods. Mm. And, you know, in my development, as we'll no doubt discuss of the Regrarians platform and what we do is about paying homage to those who come up with insights and, you know, the, these pioneers, these ecological pioneers, as Martin Mulligan's book put, called them, you know, these bombastic, hard-headed, Pioneer, yeah, like like you know, now they're now called, um, Stuart Andrews, uh, Stuart um, Peter, no Stuart, his son, yeah. on the website that they've, yes. they've now classified Peter as a yes, as a as a weed. Um, so he's a pioneer. Oh, yeah. he's, a, he's a bit of pioneer vegetation, and it's exactly right. And I'm really yeah. grateful that they've done yeah. that yeah. because it actually it's a psychological recognition of a profile that yeah. someone's had, and that's okay. Mm. Right, I was talking to him this morning actually, and yeah. he's and he's um he's yeah he's very weedy, in a good oh, way. He's an Peter. absolute pioneer, Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's yeah. a he's a yeah, he's a difficult man. Um, but he won't be unrooted. Oh, I mean, he, he's a thistle. He's like a deep rooted thistle. And and the, and the thing is, I guess, and this we're sort of getting to mm-hmm. is that um people 
um, approaching the world with new ideas have to be that type of person. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, which, yeah, so anyway, I'm, I put the book away and I didn't, and it wasn't. Was, a, I bet you that was like, a, like, that was Bill's little little test, or like a trap. He goes, anyone who touches that book, oh, I know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Bill, Bill was again, but Bill and Peter Andrews were very similar in personality. Yeah. Um, yeah right. And apparently they've met. Mm. I mean, Bill, Bill loved it, loved the blue. Yeah. Um, like a physical blue, oh. he was quite. Yeah, he could be quite aggressive, yeah. um, and so on. Um, and I'd seen that, witnessed that, or had that um, firsthand. Um, I, he never punched me, but he. I what that scar was on you. He, he threatened to. <laughs> <laughs> you and that bloody hole. Well, he just didn't book. respect my um, uh, Irish, my Irish humour. Yeah. Right. Um, anyway, one day. <laughs> anyway, probably fair enough. <laughs> but I. Um, but yeah, I put the I put that to one side, mm. and so the permaculture blinkers were kind of stayed on for a while there, and and that really didn't sit because I was. Someone asked me once um, what are my greatest influences, and it was really Fukuoka and Yeomans. Mm. The permaculture thing was there because they were the only land management courses you could do. Yeah. Um, more or less, holistic management training wasn't super available mm-hmm. um, at that stage. You know, RCS were just getting off the ground. The Bruce Wards of the world were hardly doing anything, but there were permaculture courses everywhere. Yeah, right. I mean, you're talking about the mid '90s. That was like the the zenith of permaculture activity. And I did my whole farm planning course over at uh, certificate with the University of Melbourne in '95 at uh, Longrenong at the uh, University of Melbourne College over there. And stuff. So I was at that time pulling it all together, but HM was something I, yeah, unfortunately didn't do. And so when I eventually lifted that lid, which was in, I'm going to say, the mid noughties, so quite a while later, mm. I went, what the hell? I mean, I, I felt really, I almost felt sick in the stomach that I'd overlooked such a critical thing. Especially being a systems thinker, because I, you yeah. know, I love a spreadsheet. It, like Lisa says, don't. If I mention this, if if our conversation mentions a spreadsheet, yeah, um, she says, don't tell Darren because um, he'll go and make a spreadsheet about. It. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> spreadsheets get you going. Well, spreadsheets. <laughs> I read the E Myth in nineteen ninety three when we started our farm planning business, and that was all about systems. Yeah. It was all like the E myth was a, a basically a treatise on looking at creating a franchise prototype based on what McDonald's done. Blueprint. Yeah. So mm. do what McDonald's you know, that's one of yeah. the great things about McDonald's. Um, is it's all about systems, it's yeah. all about quality control, it's all yeah. about time and time and motion studies and yeah. a, you know, systemizing everything. So when we were doing hundred to hundred and fifty farm plans a year and developing about half of those, I needed to be organised. Yeah, because we had machines everywhere and crews everywhere, and it was like, oh, oh, oh. it it was you always teetering situation. on the edge of chaos yeah. all the time. So I needed to be super organised to do that. So mm-hmm. anyway, so yeah, so when I got to the point of you know the holistic management thing coming back into my view. And now being part of it, it was like, oh, okay. That, that because, was a big... Oh, yeah, huge. Shit. I'd say bigger than anything else, really. Mm. Um, and I think to an extent, too, it was probably better then in a way because it was actually more better articulated. Yeah, right. I don't know that holistic management was completely articulated. And I still, it's, still work, it's still a work in progress, which is... Like permaculture, to an extent, when I think about that, it's not as much of a work in progress. And some permaculturists out there will definitely disagree with me, which is go for your life. But um, it's 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 framework of ethics and it's framework of principles, whether they're from David or whether they're from Bill, they're pretty well there, right? They're, they're set, set, as it were. Yeah. So now it's just about well, I'm being sent, um, simple here, but it's a uh, simplistic, but it's it's more or less how you reflect and apply those if you're if you're calling yourself a permaculturalist or you're following Mm. that methodology holistic management still got more to go like there's still i think a lot more intellectual growth in it Um, what was it about when you did the course what were some of those well i read the book first okay yeah and then you did a did the course with yeah i did the course well actually um hosted i i 
that was around the time I did the I did the world's first carbon farming courses in the United States. So we I was working for Mars Incorporated from two thousand and four to two thousand and seven in Vietnam. So we shifted our whole family over to Vietnam. Mars, Mars as in Mars bars, yeah, right, um, and dog food and all the rest of it. One of the world's biggest. Um, uh, food companies and pri- completely privately owned, owned by mm. three, uh, two brothers and a sister. Wow. And w- okay, that's another so story. I, yeah, yeah, so I was working over. The, well, I met Howard Shapiro actually at um, at uh, Bill Mollison's in two thousand and one. I was teaching a permaculture course with Bill the first time I taught a PDC. Um, in Taz- when he'd moved back to Tassie, and um, and Howard turned up, and Howard is had, was one of the founders of Seeds of Change, which is a really big seed and food company, and Mars bought them out, and when they bought them them out um, as a they bought their brand, um, they bought Howard, and Howard then went in to become the director of food science and external research for Mars Incorporated globally. Uh, Howard's an Aussie? No, Howard's a, from the US. US and he's okay. a Fulbright scholar and a PhD. Like he's a super superhuman, like mm. a genius bloke, mm. right? Anyway, he's got the he's got he's like this uh, old Russian Jew, but he's he's that's what he calls himself. He's a, he calls himself a, a biodiversifarian, um, <laughs> and he's got the most domain. You would have serious beard, M. M. You and Costa, he's got his beard comes down to here, so it's sort of like Costa's beard, but yeah. it's pure white. Oh, cool! And he's got a bald head, so it's he's, it's. Like and he, but he's upside, a genius, upside down man, like, yeah. so smart. Yeah, cool. A great agroforester, loves the whole thing, and has been a long term friend. Well, was a long term friend of Bill's. Anyway, he came to Bill's, and we met, and we had you know we were talking about agroforestry, you know. And then he kept me in his mind, and then a couple of years later, he said, oh, "I've got this job. Do you want to go up and do it?" So off we went. And we so we the whole family, kids were only, I think Isabella was only ten, mm. but the two. It, Pearl and Zane were only like three or four or something. So, yeah, we all moved up into a village in um, country Vietnam and off we went. I had this project there which was to to um, train uh, train uh, agriculture and uh, government agriculture and forestry extension offices um, in my sort of brand of key line and soil conservation, uh, regeneration, etc., and, um, and so to do design and just demonstration plots on that, and then and then do training. So I shifted my whole thing. Of the you know I can't thank Bill enough because Bill rang me one day and he said, "Oh, it's about because t- Bill, he, hey Darren, it's about time you started teaching." <laughs> That was it. <laughs> oh, I've got this course coming. Come down to Tasmania. The Jimmy God had spoken. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Although, you know, Bill and I um, smoked a lot of cigarettes together and had a lot of cups of tea <laughs> over the years. But anyway, so Bill <laughs> Bill spoke and I went down there and we did a couple of courses. And uh, But, yeah, because up to then I'd done stuff all as far as training was concerned. And um, But, yeah, after that, uh, that shifted everything. And then I became a professional trainer of professional trainers yeah. without any professional training. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> But it worked. So what was the outcome of that? Well, the outcome of that was to – the prime purpose was mm. to introduce um, cacao um, to Vietnam uh, to, so that Vietnam could grow chocolate um, because uh, the Ivory Coast around that time – I mean, the geopolitical situation was that you might remember the, the French were bombing the Ivory Coast, the Côte d'Ivory. Mm. And um, the who produce, I think, half or two thirds of the world's cacao, mm. and cacao, I think, is number five or six biggest commodity on the planet. Right, it's a really big game. It's true. And Mars are one of the three or four big players. You know, yeah. it's Cadbury's, Hershey's, Mars, and whomever else. So, yeah. anyway, they um, and Kraft, of course. So. Um, yeah, so they they and the other chocolatiers who are part of the uh, World Cacao Federation, um, they got together and said, we need to look at some other places to grow cacao. Yeah, so, yeah, right. And Vietnam was identified. It wasn't the ideal place, but a stable stable uh, government. Because a lot of places where they grow cacao are unstable uh, governments, apart from Malaysia and in Indonesia. If you go to the African you know, t- tropical countries and then in South America, they're often uh, quite unstable. So that provides... Um, poor conditions for value chain stability. So that's why they were looking at it. Yeah. But we needed to tweak the landscape because it was a seasonal rainfall. Mm. So irrigation, dams, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
Hello, Hello. Aussie. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You're the man. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was that. was that. Had you been to Vietnam before? No, I hadn't. And it was um, very interesting because the day that I arrived was the 37th anniversary. And so I didn't have nothing to do with this, mm. of the day of my father's death in Vietnam 37 years ago when he was fighting in the American War mm. as a conscript at 23. Poor bugger. Are you looking for more information to assist you on your regenerative journey? We've created an online community of supporters with exclusive access to interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions with Charlie and his interviewees, as well as the opportunity to be interviewed on the show yourself. If you would like to be part of this community or would simply like to contribute to the development of the podcast series, please make your way to patreon.com forward slash the regenerative journey podcast. We look forward to you becoming a member of the Regenerative Journey community. Let's get back to this week's episode. And when did you arrive that day and go, I'm here and this is the anniversary? Or is it something you... you oh, both. I mean, I knew it on my ticket. Yeah. Because the ticket yeah. was there on, you know, you knew the 18th day. of February has always yeah. been a significant day, mm. as we all have, significant mm. days. So, but did I mean, it's an overwhelming place. I mean, I've not spent much time in the tropics apart from... My, you know, when I was younger, going up to Cairns and shit like that. But, you know, to, this was a truly foreign place. Up to that point, I think I'd only been in New Zealand, which is a truly foreign place. Um, Aotearoa. <laughs> I've never been. New so, Zealand. Oh, mate. you got to go. you got to. I don't know. You, I mean, you'd probably need a, you'd need to get a rider to carry all this shit. <laughs> <with you. laughs> I'm dying to go. I I Because we, we've had... A lot of interest in doing some courses over there. Yeah, oh, you would. No, there's some. Yeah, oh, yeah, you, you would. Yeah, so, the BD so that, scene's pretty big in New Zealand. So, oh, yeah. totally. Well, yeah. that's the home of, of, of some of John Pierce and Peter Proctor. Yeah, and, and all that. Those are yeah, good guys. Yeah. Um, did but, that? You go. You got no. I was just going to say, landing in Vietnam that mm-hmm. day. I mean, it was. I'm um, like I said before, very uh, visual person, visual learner, mm. um, but I. People ask me what was my first memory. My first memory is lying in my – or being cradled in my nana's arms and um, it's the smell of the tallow soap that we used to make on our farm because we used to kill the beasts and then we'd render it and preserve, get all the fat and he'd make soap out of it using mm. the tallow. Yeah. And nana used it for everything, <laughs> our clothes. It was everywhere. It was everywhere. And that's my first memory is a smell memory. Yeah. So um, anyway, I, so when I got to Vietnam, the first thing you do is just go, whoa. This is a different smell. Yeah. Um, and it's telling you, like, it's a huge amount of signals that your brain is is, is is taking on. So that's my first memory of Vietnam. It wasn't, you know, it was another airport and it's a hot blah, 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 air, airport, but it was really the smell. I'm like, wow, this place, is, this place has got a lot going on. So, all good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, know that, I know this building's, like, from 1860. Two, yeah, something like that. And then yeah. door opening, I was going, "Hang on, there's still a ghost. Ghost, <laughs> there's someone behind it." Probably, <laughs> I feel like a ghost sometimes. <laughs> have you had, um, have you had this place looked at by, by, by you know, oh, my pa- our, our, middle, our, our, middle, our middle daughter Pearl, she's really perceptive like that. And we've got mm-hmm. a little dog. Um, uh, it's all right. <laughs> um, we've got a little dog who uh, apparently sees that sort of thing as well, and he gets a bit spooked when he's here. Fair yeah. Dinkum. yeah. I'm not surprised. There's Little a lot, no. lot of it, lot of it around here. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm not that perceptive. Yeah. I haven't turned. Oh, it's not there, or it's. <laughs> well, you don't. I'm not turned on. <laughs> no, <it's> not <laughs> it, I'll so, leave that to others. <laughs> so, so Vietnam, um, progression of your, I guess, another your professional development. Yeah. Well, that's it. And I mean, you know, I mean, I, I look at my life to this point. And I mean, I think. What, what year are you born? Not telling. Shit, 67 or 68? How 66. Rude. I'm not telling. In around about that. In right. I'm, 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 I'm actually like, I'm 70, but I look yeah, yeah. much younger. Yeah, yeah. Biden, so Biden Biden actually, actually, you know, I knew that was coming. You know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it works. <laughs> anyway. Um. <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, no, I... Um, I, had another, I had another leading question for you there, but now it's gone. Yeah, well, no, I just lost ghosts. my train of thought. We'll be asking. <laughs> anyway, what's, um, what's for lunch? Yeah, plenty. <laughs> Piedina. 
Um, uh, so yeah, so Vietnam that was another stepping stone. Yeah, development. Yeah, yeah the professional sort of- development thing is. Uh, yeah, I was going to say in my life, even though it's yeah, you know, I'm only oh, what am I now? Fifty three. We fifty four this year. It's um, I think because I started so young. Like a lot of people, oh, you know, my life, everyone's life's different, of course. Um, yeah, Captain Obvious. Um, but um, <laughs> but by the same token, uh, I mean, my life up until I was a – I mean, I, I left Victoria for the first time, I think, when I was 18, mm. and that was to go to Moama, right, or Wentworth, which is across Just the river. Just over the border. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So up to that point, you know, it was all about Bendigo and football and swimming and tennis and cricket and mm. family and the farm and it was all very – Localised. Localised. Um, you know, Bendigo is, you know, there's there's no cult. Very, well, up in, in the point of, up to that point in my life, had very little cultural diversity. You know, there were the people that we met were Greek, owned a fish and chip shop. Mm. Or, you know, Greeks owned fish and chip shops. Yeah. Asians own Chinese shops. Yeah. That's it. That's, that's the frame of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, there, so, yeah, it's like kind of talk about reference points or turning points. That you you have these well in my case I'll sort of look at it in blocks. Um, you've had that block, mm. that block, that block because there's always and that's it's kind of like nature as well. Well, it is like nature. Nature often well typically functions in a form of stasis, and then there's a pulse. Yep. It's kind of like when you do the when you do the the stirring in biodynamics. You know, mm. you're as uh, Podolinsky said. You know, you don't want to have it, so you're stirring for so long that the music becomes boring. Mm. Mm. You know, that's not how music works. Mm. You've got to actually get in there and crash it, create the chaos, right, yeah. and then and then you go back to a rhythm again. Yep. And it's the sort of steps of exactly and all the way along. Yeah. Then this that's why I love BD um, from that perspective is especially the stirring. I used to do a lot of BD back in the day, and you know, you just you're feeling an improvement as you go along. So over the hour of that stir, mm. you've you've actually taken the ingredients and you've you've cha- you've, you've transformed, transformed them. Transformed it, yeah. So by the end of it, you've got this material which is viscous and it's almost like it's just a yeah. So it's like food and life. So those steps that have been along the way, when I look back, I, I, I think so far it's been really super rich. Mm. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate to be all the places. I mean, I, I, it's sort of like I feel sometimes because of where I've been, from, where I, you know, who I am, how I grew up, my family, etc. It's sort of like like my I've got so many anecdotes. Mm. And I, I kind of feel a bit shitty about sharing them sometimes because it's almost like you're bragging. I, like, but that's just general life. I've got someone. Someone says something. I, oh yeah, I was, I've got a mate in Uruguay. It's like who has fucking friends in Uruguay? <laughs> but I do, and it's like I can't help that. But so I well, feel a bit it's, shitty it's, sometimes it's, sharing yeah. things like that because yeah. it's um, well, I suppose part of that is that um, especially the Irish, perhaps Australian thing. You know, you don't. The don't tall stick pop your head that, up. Yeah, don't stick your head yeah. up. Don't be a smart ass. All that sort of stuff. Don't try and think you're better. But think of it this way: you're being selfish if you don't, because if that's going to help someone, well, it's it, is, gonna, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's just been the way it is. But I feel incredibly fortunate, and that the COVID thing has certainly made me reflect on that because you can't just. So I was saying when we did our, um, we just finished a Rex the other day, um, and we did the last, the last layer was energy, and I said, you know, we take for granted that we can. Get in a car. I mean, I said two years ago, if I had enough reflection of energy in my pocket called money, I could go down to the airport and buy a ticket and go wherever the bloody hell I wanted to mm. on the earth because there's a reliable fuel supply, there's reliable yeah. planes, there's you know, everything yeah. was reliable. Somewhere and then all of a sudden, mm. COVID just said, nah. So you just can't do that. So I, my imagining of ha- resuming the life that I had of constant travel tours. I mean, I did a tour in 2019. We just, we just bought one-way tickets the mm-hmm. whole way. Just mm-hmm. went around. From, I went to 20 countries just going, dot, 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 and I could do that without even thinking. Mm. I wouldn't even contemplate such a thing now. I don't know whether I'll need vaccination certificates or whether yeah. you'll actually get there and they'll tell you you can't, can't be leave. here, you better go yeah. back. And yeah. it's like, whoa, okay. So it's a very different world. And so I'm really appreciative of, the experiences that I've had 
to date that have been so incredibly rich and met so many people. And that's probably the biggest thing. I'll miss meeting, if I can't do it anymore, I'll miss meeting the the new people, getting the new smells, catching the vibe of the place and all of that. But by the same token, I'm in an incredibly rich place here in, in Victoria. Victoria is incredibly diverse as a state. Yeah. Um, so if I didn't have to leave again, that's okay. You're adapting to the new, well, maybe not, the, hopefully not the new world, but a, a new uh, chapter of, yeah. Of, yeah. of travel or lack of or, you know. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, and I mean, you know, you, you can put your trust, again, trust nature, trust God, mm. whatever it is, here it is. Mm. So, yeah, that's where I'm at at the moment, It's which is cool. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly, I'll be, I'm, I'm sort of wondering what's, what, what's the next thing around the corner, you know, because they sort of pop up, as you know, mm. you know, is there a new biodynamics? Is there yeah. a new permaculture? Is there a new, yeah. what's the next holistic management? Yeah. Because in the way that we've developed the Regrarians platform, yes, is, let's talk about that. Well, it's a, as I've described it several times, it's like a methodology of methodologies, mm. because as I've realised that. If you were to ask me what my religiosity is, it's probably pantheistic in that um, you know God and the universe are the same. If you were going to, be, if there if there was some omnipotent being or beings out there, if that was what was real, mm. then it's yeah, then that's the way I look at it. I mean, it's a bloody big thing, unimaginable. So that sort of then applies into the layers of thinking about how one goes about managing your world in the universe. Mm. Um, your life in the universe because it seems pretty clear to me that you can't just follow one gig. You can't just follow. You can't just be a biodynamic farmer. Well, you could. You could. Well, people do. Yeah. But then but maybe not- maybe that will then find your landscape wanting mm. for more because nature, the world doesn't the, work that way. What nature does not work mm. well. Yeah. You know, mm. As David Holmgren so eloquently puts, nature is an equal opportunity employer. Of the greatest kind, right? And you haven't talked. You should go and chat to him. Yeah, I had a, I had a, that popped yeah, up the other yeah, day. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, he's not far from here. No, he? no, no. He's he's t- oh, thirty minutes from here. Which yeah. way? Um, towards Tammy's. So if you go through oh, yeah. Dale, well, he's actually before Dalesford in Hepburn. Depending yeah, on right. which road you go on. Anyway, that was a, that was a cricket bat. Oh, it wasn't the uh, bottle. Good. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't the important well, stuff. <laughs> but um, so it, as they say in holistic management, I think it was Kirk Gadsy or Alan or whatever, whomever. You know, you got to play with a full deck of cards. Yeah, like and that. but but even then, the deck, the idea that there's a limited deck is another thing. Um, there's always something that, because nature is so diverse. I mean, that's why there's no laws of biology. Um, there's no laws. There's laws of physics because they're de- and there's laws of chemistry because you're dealing with basically numbers. But there's no law laws of biology. It's super random. Uh, I just finished reading a book um, um, about the great British scientist or British then Indian scientist J. B. S. Haldane, and who was a genius um, early um, early uh, geneticist in the you know sort of worked from the. Well, from about the 1910s to 1950s, and a lot of what he found back then is what we now... And this was before they discovered DNA officially, um, but, yeah, they were all over it. And that was what he was saying. I mean, it's like, this is... this is That's why, for him, as one of those great polymaths who just, you know, could recite Greek, could, you know, could, could do the Iliad... <laughs> In for group, three days. Backwards. It, yeah, yeah. yeah, for three days or whatever mm. it took. Mm. But also knew everything about biology that there basically was to know at that time and this and that and so mm. on. Um, you know, genius guys like that would even say, this is really big shit, right? Yeah. So when you come to the noble task of repairing agricultural landscapes and trying to make a living out of that, something I've personally not done, I should say. I'm not a farmer on a land, piece of land, so just put, put that out there. But working with people to help them, facilitate them to do that, you have to realise that nature is a really, really diverse um, thing, as it were, and then you've got the climate. 
Mm. And then you've got the economy. Yeah. And then you've got all these bloody layers, you know, you know, and then you've got you. Yeah. Because you'll change. Um, your yeah. wife will change or yeah. your partner will change or your kids will change. So there's all of whom are biological elements, by the way. Um, so it's it's a it's a so you know, you don't want to confine yourself to any I, I believe, um, you don't want to confine yourself to any single philosophy. And that my title at, at um, which Howard, I think, in, he gave me when I worked for Mars was an integrated consultant. Yeah, right. Which I think is an awesome one. Which makes sense. Sort of means nothing, really. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, he, it's sort of like whatever it works, is. whatever bloody works at the end of the day. And, and, and I guess really that whole um, uh, philosophy, you know, call yourself an integrative consultant or, you know, an adapter of situations and, and practices... That is reflective of nature, isn't it? It's yeah, a, it's absolutely. All nature, the, like David the, said, you the know, diversity of 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 resources, scenarios, temperatures, geology. Well, you look at Peter Andrews and Son Stewart. You know their sort of thing about the species that they will use. Yeah, um, which is where David, the context of what David's thing about equal opportunity. Yeah, it's not about being speciest, about yeah. being nativist or whatever. It's about what works. What's what's almost what's ex- re- what's ex- required. Well, when I look at a weed infestation, I think well, first of all, it's actually got a specific name. So let's start with that. Yeah. All right. It's got a it's got a genus and a species. Weed name. has connotations, right? Yeah, exactly. You know who who am I as a human to think that I'm smarter than that plant? Now, if there's a field of that plant. Well, I might. Or do I feel smarter than that plant? You know, and that's the no. I mean, if I was to leave it and facilitate it again, well, that plant and that plant community is actually giving me a whole range of signals about mm. probably my management. And the thornier and more bastardy that it is, is an even greater smack in the head to you that you mm. should wake up to the bloody hell what you're doing, right? Mm. So. Now, that can be a hard pill to swallow, totally. um, but it's one that sometimes you've just got to look in the mirror and face up to responsibility sometimes. And, uh, you know, the stronger the weed, the, the bigger the responsibility, I suppose. And, I, and that is a big um, paradigm for farmers, especially new farmers, getting back to, mm. you know, mm. clients of, not specific clients, mm. but I guess in, your, in the context of you facilitating, assessing um, your clients and, and, and new farmers go to a, a farm, which is the usual thing. That's yeah. my. I'm, I'm usually involved in startups, startup things. Yeah. So you're turned up. There's a paddock of thistles, and they're going. Oh, what do we? How, how do we get rid of them? You know, I've got an order. Yeah, because they may well have an order to get rid of them. And from the oh, council, from the cave, okay, yeah, yeah, so they're, they're noxious, or, yeah, they, or yeah. they've got they're, they're being frowned upon by their neighbours. Yeah, going bloody yeah, yeah. people, or they've already got the MCPA in the in the shed, ready to go, yeah. and 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 that understandably is. Um, uh, the you know the initial reaction of a new manager, the new mm-hmm. owner of the farm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to you know thistles are bad. That's what they understand. Mm-hmm. Not reading, not reading. It's, it's 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 their paradigm. And you know, do you remember just as an aside? Do you remember that old roundup ad a few years ago where it had a Scotch thistle? I think it was beautiful. It was a brilliant ad. I mean, the psychology of it was breathtaking. Lots of good. psychology. Yeah. Well, yeah. there was a. There was a Scotch thistle, mm. um, so a pink shock of punk hair. Yeah, right. So it turned a, a, a turned a thistle into a, into punk. a punk. Yeah, everything and you know everything that was anti-authority mm. and anti-orthodox. And actually, I don't know if it was Roundup or something or, or one of these herbs. It was called Stomp or something. You know. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it just came. You know, big foot came yeah. down on it. That'll learn you. That'll yeah. learn you, punk. Yes. Right. Yeah. And you see. That sort of psychology, well, you know, um, you've been that punk. Totally. Yeah. So um, you go into the pub, you go to the footy club or whatever, you don't, you know, you don't want to put your head up, right? Because you get stomped on. Totally. Um, so or the biodynamic guy. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the weirdo. Well, will you remember um, in WA, I've still got some um, clips of it there, they were dissing... Um, oh. Yeah, the cow horn thing. This is back in the nineties. I remember there were clippings, newspaper clippings. They were put in the rural press over there. This happened just, the other day. Oh, really? And yeah. just as an aside, and I hope I get this this right. So, um, and this is not 
having a go at anyone. This is just what happened. Yeah, sure. That um, I think it was the Minister for Environment in WA last year, when, or might have been the year before, when there was some seriously good stuff going on, you know, approaches to regenerative agriculture. I can't oh, remember who. Al- the, uh, no, the Ag Minister, Alana. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 I, and I can't remember who. It might have been, was it Diane Ian Hegarty? Um, yeah, yeah. Th- there was that, oh, my God, this is amazing agriculture yeah. and, and approach to farming. Mm-hmm. And I think in her... Um, and then... In, in her reference, in her... She was quoted as saying, you know, regenerative ag, or maybe not that cow horn stuff, but, you know... Yeah. So there was a little... Not bio, uh, yeah, bio uh, bullshit stuff. Yeah, there was yeah. a bit of an aside, a bit of a, a backhander, which is fine because, you know, um, that'll... that'll. Count. Well, I, I hope Michael doesn't mind me... Um, quoted him from a private dinner the other night, but we were talking about this, about the, the, the variable conversation mm. you know, that, that I had earlier. And um, and he was saying, look, you know, we know we know so much about all the, the soil chemistry, soil physics, that's all pretty... Science. And he's a, you know, he's, a, mm. he's a soil science of international... Soil scientist of international calibre, mm. head of the, the cooperative research um, centre for, for soils in this country, yeah. for soils excellence... And he's saying the big thing now, and he's you know trained at Melbourne Uni, PhD, all that, and the big thing now is soil biology. Yeah, and it's like, what is that? Where, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, where do you which, start? which, which, you know, again, on this thread of us not wanting to back one horse or be on one horse, and you know, this world is not a one horse world. I mean, we look at this. We were smooth sailing in twenty nineteen. Mm. No one saw well, COVID coming, yeah. and bang. And and you know, just on that, um, Daz, in the you know the, the courses, biodynamic courses we run, you know, we talk about or Hamish talks about the measurable and unmeasurable. Mm-hmm. You know, that the, the two streams, the Newtonian scientific stream, mm-hmm. that everything's mm-hmm. measurable essentially and mm-hmm. can be pulled apart and analysed and reduced, yeah, and reduced, which is a good thing because yeah, it, sure. it, it it enables us to understand things somewhat and at least in isolation. Yeah, you shouldn't but throw that baby out with the bathwater, totally. which is what a lot of people do. That's yeah. it; they write it right off. And then there's the sort of the Gertian, you know, side of it mm-hmm. where it's and 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 dare I say, indigenous side of it mm-hmm. where it's the unmeasurable. Mm-hmm. And thank God that's there, you yeah. know. And thank God that everything isn't hasn't been pulled to its to its parts and, and analysed, mm. and we understand it because it's in that space between the not understanding and the understanding, or the measurable and the unmeasurable. That's where the good stuff happens. Mm. You know, that's yeah. where we can sort of combine the two: the stream of science, which is fascinating, that we can look at and into things in such detail, but the immeasurable, indigenous. Um, you know, ancient, um, unmeasurable side of it. And, you know, in the world of biodynamics, you talk about nature spirits or elementals and there's a whole cosmic side of all of that. That's where the colour is. Yeah, that, and you know. I, I know you talked to our mutual friend Cindy Lovett recently, or Cindy O'Meara. O'Meara, yes. Yeah, Cindy's yes. from Bendigo. She's an old family friend. Yeah, that that has been one of the most popular, I've got to say, and she, oh, she's, she's, she's fantastic. Oh, she's a great, great human being. She's but, I mean, you know, you, you get into our inner biology. Totally. And then all of the influences of everything on all of that. I mean, that's that's a whole that's a whole brave new world. I mean, it's it's quite amazing and exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And one that'll again, this is the, when I say this is the thing. It's not just there's a whole range of things, but you know, these are all steps in our journeys that if uh, and we're capable of it. I think. Mm. Um, if we are allow it and manage it mm. well enough, open to it, to open to it exactly to um, really improve um, our health and our prospects and those of our families and the broader future of the place. So, and that's the choice we have, isn't yeah. it? Like as yeah. as operating humans in the world, yeah. who have access to information, experience. Well, a lot of people don't have choices, and I speak about that. I mean, it's always. You know, we all sit with our, within our own context and it's, again, when you come to the to being the facilitator again, you've got to appreciate that it's mm. not you you're here for, it's them. And a lot of people who've got, uh, you know, the whole privilege argument is around that to an extent and that goes within um, a lot of people who are apparently have privilege, which is part of my discussion on that, is to say, well, yeah, there's privilege and there's privilege. I know, mm. you know, there's a lot of people who for a variety of reasons, say have a sh- really shit debt, debt to equity ratio. There's not a lot of privilege in having a really bad debt to equity ratio. Yeah, they're landowners, yeah, they're, well, 
kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> stewards. <laughs> if well, they're not stewards. Yeah, they can't be stewards mm. because when you've got that kind of economic situation, well, then the land is the loser yeah. because the land has to Subsidizing. be exploited. Yeah, yeah the lo- lo- and that's that's unfortunately, especially I think we got to the eighties, the the great drought of the early eighties, um, really. Uh, it sifted out a lot of people who were really bad managers. Mm. Um, and I think, in a way, the banks, you know, you know, a lot of people probably kill me for this, for saying this, but they actually probably, in a large part, did the land a favour. Yeah. Um, a lot of landscapes at that point um, were released from, from, the, from the terrible management practices which had, which had ensued. And in some ways, actually, got the drought to be as bad as it was. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there was oh, there was atmospheric, yeah. econo- um, and, and ecological. I mean, other the seasonal stuff. But then there's yeah. also how bad was it? Well, drought? one of my one of my good mates, uh, Wayne Robbins, who's out at Minyip, he's a um, conventional, well, conventional no till cereal producer. And we were talking about this. I was telling Michael Crawford about this the other day. You know, he was saying that you know I think it was. Was it two years ago? I think it was 2017, 18, or 2016, 17, I can't remember. But anyway, it was a pretty bad year. Mm. And during the crops, the crop growing season, they had five and a half, six inches of rainfall. And he said that my dad, uh, Bob, who's fortunately still with us, um, in 1982-3 had the same rainfall conditions and had nothing, no crop. I'm here, you know, using all of the modern agronomy, yeah, tools, herbicide, no-till, blah, blah, blah. But he actually got a regional average crop mm. with the same rainfall. Mm. And it's not like you know he changed farms or anything, or he got more out of the sky. It was basically a carbon copy of the conditions, and um, here we are. It was all about the, the it was all about the management. Of those yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and practices which a lot of people, um, perhaps in the regenerative agriculture space, unfortunately it, it, um, diminish. You know, the novel chemistry and this, that, and the other. But again. My point on that would be that don't throw that baby out with the bathwater. A lot of people would just love to see that there was no novel chemistry, that there was no Roundup used anymore, that there was you know, no artificial phosphorus being spread, you know, and on it goes, no not you know, artificial N and stuff. But that would be that would be akin to us not having job keeper last year. Yeah, I think it, it, uh, you know, it's 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 you know it's because Keynesianism, Keynesianism equates over to landscapes as well. Yeah. And I, as I think they, as they are. Yeah, totally. And um I've lost my train of thought there now. Yeah, well last oh, year, no, trans, yeah. I think about transition. So I, I went cold turkey because mm. I mm. learnt what I learned in a short period of time went, mm-hmm. oh my God, I'm not going to do this shit anymore. Mm. You mm. know, for well there reason. is that, yeah. But there's also that transition of you know, as a grazier day. or as a cropper, both. Yes. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I I, I, tr- I cold turkey cropping straight out, straight out. Yeah. I just thought I don't. Well, that's hard. Th- it is harder, and it yeah. was probably not the wisest thing. No. And, and I guess I was quite ideological at that point. Going, mm-hmm. I don't want to be spraying shit on my ground anymore, knowing what I was doing. Or me, or my, or my yeah. family, yeah. and the yeah. the whole thing. You know, because I've been doing it for years and and doing a good job of it. And I just, you know, the, the guilt of of doing that again, even in a transitionary sort of phase. What I'm saying is, though, I and, and you know, I always talk about transitioning and, and suggesting if you're using, if you're spending, you know, some hundreds of dollars per hectare in a cropping situation, don't change your budget. Just change ten percent. Put that into a biological or a different, or even if it's a course, you know, spend ten percent of that on a course and just don't put as much urea on whatever it is and transition and, and find your way through it. And again, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, absolutely. Because that would cause some dramas, and it did did for me. Yeah, Daz. Um, Let's talk more about your platform, Agrarians, and the yeah. re- and the Rex. Tell me about the Rex. Oh, the Rex. <laughs> well, the Rex. Do you, uh, do you want to? We don't have to. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now here comes the advertorial part of this presentation. <laughs> uh, this episode is brought to you by. No, I, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm up no, for no, it. No, so am I. Um, no, um, well, the Rex. The Rex actually goes back to the beginning in a way. Mm. Um, in that, uh, well, in the beginning of my farm planning journey, because if you, you, you strip out the permaculture thing and the key line thing and a few other elements, maybe not so much the key line. Key line, 
when it was originally mooted, especially in its halcyon days of the late 50s, early 60s, um, was mooted as being a system that uh, farmers could learn and then they could develop their own systems. It was very much about self-determination. Yeah. Right? Principles and then you, you apply. Yeah, them. you learn. you learn the basic framework of the key line scale of permanence and how to apply that. Um, and you looked at a landscape and you looked at, you broke it down um, into its various components, which is not that different to soil conservation by soil uh, um, land planning. Uh, but you did that and then you came out with a plan and Yeoman said, you know, if you got anybody who was well-trained in key line, you would give them the same property, put them in separate rooms, bring them back together, the plans would pretty well be the same. Yeah, same Which I, I get that, yeah. right? Because um, I've seen that with the people that we've trained in key line, um, in, that, in the key line plan, as it's called. Because it's a very peculiar pathway, which if you understand it, then you'll get very similar outcomes. Permaculture, you don't, because that's mm. much more diverse and there's a lot more elements to permaculture than there is to key line. And there's I guess a lot there's more also layers to it. And also that personal, you know, what, what, what's my vision for this land and do I prefer this type of enterprise to that and all, all yeah. that elements. Yeah, I mean, key line largely was developed for graziers. Mm. Um, just I'm, talking, as, I'm talking permaculture as, as, as the, the more human element and overlay. Yeah, 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 but I mean, it tends to be like a lot of people who are in permaculture, as, a, as a, just as a side point, um, a lot of people who are in permaculture are probably what, and David Holmgren talks about this, are you a plant person or you're an animal person? And I would say that most people in permaculture are more plant people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there's the, and when I say plant, usually horticulturalist and perennial horticulturalist. Yeah. So there's a really strong basis of that and that, that extends to forestry and all of that sort of thing. I don't know why that is, but that is what it is. And I would say also politically, a lot of people who, to just to broadly categorise, a lot of people who are into permaculture are probably a bit more left of centre mm. than, that's my observation, than they are right of centre. Sure. If you were go to holistic management, a lot more people, I would say, are definitely more right of centre politically. Yep. Um, and they're more into grazing. Yes. Right? And some of them have a complete antipathy for anything that has wood in it. Um, as a, as as <laughs> tissue, um, it's all grasslands wall to wall. Oh, actually, <laughs> even fencing shouldn't have wood in it anymore. So damn that wood. Yeah, away damn that with wood. you, wood. Away with you, woody tissue. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> how dare you come onto my property? So yeah, you get you get those two worlds. Um, so when I look at uh, the Rex. The Rex was very much, I think, when I finally came up with it, it was, I remember being on a plane one day and I was, I was it was when I was doing the carbon, I was doing, we were all in these carbon farming, so I came up with this carbon farming tour in 2007, that's where we got on the Vietnam thing. Mm. I saved up all this dough, we had a little property outside of Bendigo, we are going to build our dream farmhouse, blah, 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 and, and I had, I don't know, about 50 or 60 grand I'd saved up, and Alan, Alan Yeoman's dumped on, the, on me the manuscript of Priority One. And Alan was the first person in the world in an address in California in 1989 to come up with agriculture as being, well, agricultural soils as being a primary place to download the atmospheric carbon pollution, put it into ag soils. He was the first person to come up with that whole concept. Cool, yeah. And his book, Priority One, which prior to that was called Green Pawns and Global Agriculture or something, which wasn't really politically correct, but that's Alan. <laughs> um, he, uh, he came up with this whole um, key line agricultural solution that said if we, uh, well, basically he said, if on the 5 billion hectares of arable land mm. on the planet, mm. so class 1, 2, 3 soils of the planet, if we, um, can sequ- if we can increase the soil carbon by 1.6% on those 5 billion hectares, then we would withdraw 100 parts per million of carbon dioxide of the atmosphere and bring us basically down back to pre-industrial levels of about 270 parts per million ppm. And I thought, wow, that's pretty bloody compelling. And I thought... And I said to Lisa, what do you reckon? She goes, yeah, let's go on a tour. So we, so we bought six, uh, five round world tickets and got our kids together and said, we're off on a tour. Well, at that stage, they were already, because they had never been in Australia hardly. Um, 
because yeah. So anyway, so we just got in our bike and for thirteen months toured the world doing um, what we called was the uh, water, which is a play on Yeoman's water, uh, soil, water, and carbon for every farm, because Yeoman's book was water for every farm. So we did that world tour in from April uh, March um, 07 to about um, April '08. And during that time, that was when I pulled it all together. I went, okay, we've got this modality, we've got that. Because it was sort of like, I I called it my interview of the planet. Mm. Because I went around, I went, you know, when you teach, as you would know, doing that, you go around and you're basically finding new things all the time. It's a really good opportunity for that. And being a bit of a soak, I'd go here, I went to Spain, I went to here. And you could... When people invite you on those sorts of things, like you get invited to just the most amazing farms and da 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 and then you've got all these people who come, so come and see my farm. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to all these amazing joints and all this amazing food which came with it, which is another passion, obviously. And um, you've got all of that, and that sort of all combined to what you might say, you know, to put my culinary hat on, a, a, a fusion restaurant, mm. right, where the influences are global. Um, where the methodologies are global, where now we've got a complete composition, which you can't just throw everything together on a plate. It's got to be composed correctly, composition, right? Yeah. yeah, so you've got, you know, someone orders something because they like it, but the plate has got to be put together in a, in a way. Now you can't just put a couple of bits of zucchini and put a squeeze on it. It's actually, that doesn't look attractive, but you can put the same components together mm. in the right way, exactly the same components, but artistically dressed, so there's a function to the form, or there's a form to, yeah, so on, and it all works. And that's really how the whole Rex thing came together, was assembly of all these parts. Because my next thing was, I remember I drew this diagram where it was discs, so I thought of each methodology as a disc, right, an icon, Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, like a Facebook icon or whatever. So here's permaculture, here's key line, here's um, soil food where they're elaining them. Here's biodynamics. Here's Peter, uh, natural sequence farming. Mm. Da, 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 holistic management. There's just a ton of them. Mycology, etc. There's all of these things that are going on in the broader regenerative ag, ecological ag, whatever space. So I'm putting all of that together, and then I came up with what's called the um, the carbon farming course and the carbon economy course. And that was the genesis of all of that. And then around that time as well, um, I, I no, that's right, in 2011, which was a bit later, um, Bruce, the late Bruce Ward, the late great Bruce Ward rang me up and said, oh, what, can you come up and um, teach? We're getting to, we, all of us holistic management educators, we've got together and we've identified that land planning is a weak link in, in our holistic management. I said, yeah, sure. He said, I'll talk to Ian Chapman about it. So I talked to Ian Chapman, who's a great fellow. Do you know Ian? I don't I, yeah, I know. He's, of him. he's, he's yeah. in the Orange District anyway, yeah. and a really good key liner. Mm. And I said, So, Ian, how do you, because he was teaching key line at TAFE with holistic management. I said, How do you do it? And he goes, oh, I, do it. I use the scale of permanence. And I went, You do what? And he goes, Well, my whole teaching is I start at climate and then I do land shape. And I went, Fuck me. It's just like, it was like, I like where's, that old, old, where's that little cricket bat? I need, I need one of those big four-inch <laughs> blocks that they use now. A big Dave Warner <laughs> pull shot. <laughs> it's, like the it's been sitting there all that time. I've taught yeah. key line for years, yeah. la, 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 and I just, and as a process guy, I just kind of, fuck me. Yeah. Anyway, so I, um, <laughs> so I go up there, and that was the first time I used the scale of permanence. As a... As a thing, but then yeah. I realised the scale of permanence is is limited because, and the Omen said this when he released that when he first talked about the key line scale of permanence of all things agricultural. That's the full terminology. Um, he said, "Yeah, I think this is pretty good, but I probably need to. It could probably be, be thought out a bit more." And he was damn right because what it didn't, it wasn't holistic, mm. so it didn't it didn't think about or discuss um, so the psychological context of a farmer or a, an enterprise. It didn't talk about the enterprise health, its economy, etc. cetera. Um, and it didn't talk about energy, whether that's metaphysical or whether that's, you know, do I have, how am I powering my job? Yeah. You know, uh, where, where's it all coming from? 
what machinery am I using, etc. So that was, so I thought, well, how do I add that on? So I basically I looked at it and went, there's no changing Yeoman's scale of permanence. He 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 got that right, right? And but I thought, well, where does economy go and where does energy go? And I felt, well, economy these days you can change your economy pretty quickly, mm. especially in this internet era. I often talk about Shopify or Facebook Marketplace or whatever you can you can turn your shop on really, really quickly. Whereas you know when you and I were with Tiger Snakes, you had to go and you had to physically drive to Sydney or Bathurst or where a major centre and go into the business name joint and stand in line and da 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 da. Whereas now way, yeah. it's all online. It's so fast, mm. so you can change your situation. Even selling stuff, you can go on Facebook Marketplace. I can put that. That that saw on yeah, there tomorrow. now yeah, and it's gone. sold. Bang, money in my account, jobs yeah. over. So and then I thought, well, energy. Well, energy ultimately comes down to a photon of light. That's where it all starts. And a photon of light, as far as I know, um, is has the shortest time frame of anything. Um, so and photosynthesis is the is the engine of everything. That well, that we're involved with that, anyway. Yeah. Whether that's the oil that we use from way back when, mm. or whether that's you and I having the energy from photosynthesis to sit here, and all of those who've made all of this gear, all of this internet, everything, we're all driven by that. That's it, and gravity, mm. which is keeping our asses on these seats right now. So that was where I sort of got to, and then I thought, well, and then I started to look at the the platform and go okay well we went through each category and tweaked each one so i looked at i looked at climate i thought well yeah the climate is the climate you can't do much about that but then i, I went oh the climate of the mind the holistic where does holistic management fit into mm-hmm. this frame mm-hmm. and that was when i thought oh well that's that's the you know when you try when you're looking at it from a from a pedagogy from a teaching tool or a process tool you got to come up with well, yeah. There's a layer, but what's within that layer? Mm. And so when I look at when I look at broadly describing the climate layer, it's you to start with. You wake up with you every day. It's you. <laughs> You're pretty involved. You. You're pretty involved. You've got your attitudes. You've got your backstory. Blah 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 blah. And and you've got your skills and your outlook and your capabilities. Um, and then there's around the people around you. There's society, your own society, and the broader society, and so on. And then there's regular. There's you know, you start to look at the way the word climate is used. The regulatory climate. It's a climate because it's hard to bloody change, right? Yeah, and there's, variable, and variable, and so on. Yeah, you go from juris- jurisdiction, jurisdiction, etc. So, the climate layer worked really well for that. And then, the, and then it was land shape. I went, oh, it should be geography because geography mm. is a lot more of a um, encompassing word. You know, geography is really where you're looking at the place of people and where they are, as well as just the raw landforms and its geology. Yeah, right. And then water, water. You know, was water's water? Um, <laughs> what's what goes on with water? It's right. <laughs> and then you've got um, – he had farm roads. I went access because yeah. access is a lot more accessible yes. um, and more encompassing. Um, he had farm trees. I went forestry because that's yeah. – you know, and I look at that as being basically the biology layer, yeah. um, flora, fauna, fungi, and other organisms. And then we looked at uh, – what's the next one? Um Forestry, oh, buildings. He had farm buildings. Well, I think it's buildings. Yeah. Um, and then you've got fencing. Well, he had subdivision. I called it fencing because back that, which is a reflection of that era, which is what you were doing when you got your grants years ago. Mm. Um, it was all about subdivision. Right. Yeah, yeah, subdividing. Smaller it up. paddocks. Whereas now, um, you would do all of that with really lightweight, uh, really lo- much lower cost temporary fencing and right. all of that. And so temp- it's all it's all shorts. it's all a reflection of the time. Yeah, right. Right. Um, and then you've got soil, soil soils. Um, and then economy and energy went on the back of that. So that moment with Ian, that's why I'll always be thankful to Ian and Bruce as well, but particularly Ian, um, was the major step, like mm. a really major step in everything. Because up to that point, I was sort of like a bit confused. How do I put on. this together? <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you come to a place and you do X, Y and Z. It was sort of like there wasn't, there wasn't, well, there was an X, Y, Z, but it just felt empty. It mm. sort of didn't feel complete enough and it didn't um, address, it didn't 
allow me to address the broad con- broad enough context of the different production systems, agricultural production systems that are out there. And I just wasn't satisfied. I just became decreasingly satisfied with permaculture as a framework. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of people put... Oh, it's a great framework, don't get me wrong. Um, it's amazing. But it just started to get really limited for me. Um uh, in its application, particularly when it came to commercial ag for a variety of reasons um, and holistic management the same. Um, and it, part of that's because of the people who are involved in that. And like I said, you know, there, there's, there's plant people and then there's more woody plant people and there's grazing people and they you know, didn't really come together too well. Mm. And so I sort of tried to pull that together. And I think we've done a reasonable job of that. And then that, I mean, my study of, uh, like I look at Yeomans a lot. I mean, Yeomans was a towering figure in Australian agriculture. And um, if it wasn't, I, I firmly believe if his wife hadn't have died in 1964, as she did, unfortunately, um, then his influence on Australian agriculture would have mu- been much more profound because he had to sell all of his farms to pay the death duties. Wow. So he bought all of these farms, he and his wife, and he unfortunately, did it. they did it in joint names. I mean, he didn't know his wife was going to die. No. So he had to sell all of it. He had farms all over the joint, and he was flying. He had all of demonstration them. Had, farms, as it were. Well, they were actual running yeah. farms. Yeah, but they, um, and he was a, he lived in Vaucluse. You know, he's a, he was a wealthy man. He was a wealthy young man. I mean, he started Key Lime when he was in his early forties. He had three genius kids. Well, his two younger boy, uh, two older boys were were really really precocious, and uh, he had them young. So he was young when they were. Mm. Um, late teens, and they were, they and their mates who were all going to the University of Sydney and New South Wales, like his, his kids all went to King's College and all that. So he's got all these bright young fellas and, and women around him and a whole world paying attention to him. And he's coming up against orthodoxy, but he's going pretty bloody well because mm. his farms are speaking for themselves. Yeah. And he's a force of nature as a speaker. And then his world dies mm. in terms of his wife and all of his properties get taken away from him. His machinery business gets taken away from him. Like it's just a – it's a major, major disruption in someone's life. And he didn't – I don't think he ever really recovered from that. Mm. And you see that in his writings and whatnot. So – but the biggest thing that Yeomans didn't leave behind in his legacy was a pedagogy. And when you look at the history of different movements, whether it's – um, religion. All religions have a pedagogy. They all have a book, and they have a teaching. Mm. There's a there's a training. You know, you you can't just be turn up and say I'm a priest. You actually have to go to a seminary. You have yeah. to go through a training program. A process, yeah. um, you permaculture. One of the reasons mm. why permaculture is so successful as a as a movement is because there Mollison had the genius to create a a, a course which can be taught by anybody mm. around the world. And it's more or less the same course. It's got the same curriculum and so on. Holistic management, the same. They've got courses. So when I look at um, the legacy of our impact on, on, the, on the big goal here, which is land regeneration, you know, us as a species having a role in that and having a future broadly, and that this planet um, is in a pretty good shape when we finally peg out of the scene as a species, as all species do, um, uh, apart from sharks. Um, <laughs> and, and crocodiles. And crocodiles. <laughs> Maybe that says something. Um, I think they're all going to Mars, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they're already there. They're already there. Um, that, that this, yeah, you've got to have that in order to, and that's that. And, it, and the other thing about it too, Charlie, I've been very aware of the sort of cult of the personality thing that goes with all of this. And I, I again, probably a homage to my upbringing that that doesn't sit well with me. And I've had a few people have said, oh, you know, you should should put yourself out, you know. When I've been around all these people, you know, it's sort of like I get it. Um, and I've worked for a lot of high net, you know, as you know, a lot of super high net worth people and all that. And I, I know that there's a personality and there's a position and there's an exposure that goes with that in terms of the context of your family, the mm. impacts of all of that and so on. And I just, that's not me. That's not where I want to go. So, um, although I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm more than capable of doing it and there's an awful temptation to succumb to the ego 
that goes with that. But um, the the ego rewards, you might say, mm, climb the ego ladder. Yeah, yeah. So from there's that. So I've tried to make it so that, which is a bit of a different tack, try and make it more about the platform than about the founder of the platform. Totally. Um, and that so because, that because that plat the, the 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 that is can be perpetuated forever. Like the person, if it's too tied up in the individual. Well, that's right. That's well. I mean, I've, I I did a I did a series of consultations for Amma, uh, Amma the hugging saint from India. Like for some reason, a lot of her people liked what I was doing, and they and brought me in. I said, and I, you know, once you get past the, I, I immediately became fascinated in her in her program, and I said, I, and I said to the to her people, I said, what happens when Amma dies? Mm-hmm. What have you got? Because what you've got at the moment is the Dharma, which is the hug. And really, once she goes, she's not going to live. She's not immortal, mm-hmm. right? Um, once she goes, who's going to give the hug and where's the value proposition there? And it's, you know, so I look at all of that. Um, and you're right. I mean, the other thing too, when I spoke about e-myth, one of the things that Michael Gerber wrote about in the e-myth was that when you, when you the, the idea behind creating a franchise prototype is that if you exit the room, as it were, then it won't be the collapse of everything. Totally. Because those who are inculcated in how to make a burger, mm. you don't need to, no. that burger, will, but the burger will still be the same. Mm. right? So you go to any Macca's restaurant around the world, which I know you're awfully familiar with. Oh, that's it. Um, my first, it's well, my I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an affiliate of fish kind of guy, but anyway... <laughs> Um, and a hot, hot, hot Especially caramel on Good Sunday. Friday. Hot caramel Sunday, yes. <laughs> oh, the, yes they make hot ones, do they? A hot caramel Sunday, I still love them. <laughs> I'd always order a fillet of fish. <laughs> a fish. A, uh, I, <laughs> Was it fish? It's got to be shark, flake. Yeah, probably. Fillet of surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fillet of surprise <laughs> and a hot caramel Sunday <laughs> and um, and some fries. Bloody oh, and a choco pie. Yeah, I'm still, and I'm still, I'm, I'm, there's still some of it in me, I'm sure. <laughs> 20 or 30 years later. Residual. Yeah. But anyway, you know, it's the same experience. Mm, totally. So you take all of those experiences and, and that's where the Rex. The other thing, the mm. big influence on the Rex too, I think, and I was talking about this recently. Oh, shit. Um, limited space remaining. Okay. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think we're no, still on. Yeah. I'll try it. Oh, yeah. 15, 15 minutes. Yeah, that's about right anyway, you, you'd have to say. Oh, I know. <laughs> <Thank God. laughs> Another card. Um, <laughs> Thank God it's running out. <laughs> Thank God you've got an editor. Um, the, no, the other big influence, which I just wrote about um, recently, um, which we haven't discussed, was the Potter Farm plan. Yeah. Um, the Potter Farmland plan, which um, the Ian Potter um, Foundation, which is mm. one of Australia's great uh, philanthropic um, foundations, um, they funded in, I think it was from 82, 83 to about 85. Mm. And they got um, uh, Andrew Campbell, who's um, pretty well known now in the Landcare Thank space. You, and totally. so, so Landcare started here in Victoria, um, in Maryborough, in that district just only you know, 20, 30 minutes from here to the west of here. 89. Oh, really, you go, you go back even further to that, like the true start of it was in yep. the early 80s with yeah, a right. range of different activities yep. that were going on. Officially 89. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, but it really started earlier than that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, the the first really big uh, organised project, I'd say, around that whole space was the Potter farm, Farmland Plan, which happened in the Western District. So mm-hmm. a whole, um, I think there was, I don't know, 10 or 15 farms, mm-hmm. most of People went to Geelong Grammar. I think it was should have been called the Geelong Grammar um, Farmland Plan. <laughs> farmland Plan. <laughs> it's all right. I designed Geelong Grammar. It's not Grammar. too late. I can say that. Oh, did you? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's amazing. I've never been. Oh, mate. Well, it's get spectacular. I'll do some... Do you reckon they'd be up for a biodynamic workshop? Oh, no, <laughs> but I mean, might have a crack at that. Yeah. Anyway. Well, <laughs> On our, our people will talk to each other. Yeah. Um, anyway... Um, yeah, so they, they always graze, mostly grazing with a bit of mixed cropping and stuff, mm. as is typical to that part of the world. Uh, they had uh, a combo of um, government mm. and, uh, well, I think it was the Department of Ag and at uh, back then, and um, private uh, farm planning, agricultural con- consultants came together and the concept was that the farmer became the planner. Yeah which is that self-determination thing. Totally. So when I went and did the farm planning training in 94 or 5 or whatever it was at Longrenong, 
the impact the this this like the the influence of the Potter farmland mm-hmm. plan was was all over Strong, that. Strong, yeah. Yep. and it was um, and it was basically the blueprint. So there was this, and that's what Yeomans was coming up against. See, when Yeomans was getting about, he was so far ahead of the soil conservation. Uh, like he was a, originally into soil so, soil conservation as it as it was as a practice or set of practices which came out. And were from the United States and were kind of adapted here mm. and in New Zealand, that's right. And, um, and he found the limitations of that fairly – because he, as he said, you know, it's not about conserva- – conservation is not good enough. It should always be about um, creation. Creation. Yeah. So – and, and exactly. Mm. You, to conserve something kind of like sustaining something, it's like someone said to me, um, would you describe your marriage as sustainable? And um, well, <laughs> would Lisa think about that? <laughs> Sometimes she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> How rude! I oh, know. No, she gives me. That's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I'll have to get rid of you, her now. To yeah, you will. Write, please, write of reply. please do. Yeah, but um, yeah. So, so when you look at those two different spaces, the Yeomans went along with this whole big, big D development approach, and da 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 da, and like he. He paid no attention to land classes, for example, because um, he thought a land can always change in its capability. Yeah. Whereas, as you would have learned at ag school, you know, a land you class, you know, it's it's crop, you know, it's class one, it's class two, it's class eight, it's class five. It's it is what it is, yeah. right? Yeah. You just do, you just run that set of land uses on that particular class. You do the best. There's a series of practices and treatments that go around that, but it's classes, it's class. And Yeomans went. Uh, I don't know so much. Mm. We can do all of these things, these sort of advanced treatments, which and add water to it. Yeah. And hey, press guys, right? Scott, yeah, to an extent. So there were those different philosophies that were going on, and um, so it was really interesting to go and do that because that was farm planning orthodoxy, mm. as it was um, coming up against. At the same time, I was doing the key line training and the permaculture training, which were obviously outside of orthodoxy and um so bringing that all together into the rex um has been a really great journey and i don't know how many people we've put through the rex now so in the in the face because we started we we started by doing 10 day rexes so we do a day to a layer so i'd go to a place it'd be the host farm the farm would be the the topic if you like and we'd have 30 to 80 people turn up we put them into groups and day one, we do the climate layer. And then, you know, we do that in the morning, like presentation. And then the afternoon, they'd come up with, in their groups, they'd work and come up with, you know, the pop, the water layer. So they'd come out where the pipe's going, where the dam's going, whatever it is to do with the fencing layer. So they'd come up with that and we'd present and they'd talk. So we did, I think we did about 500 people or so. I did... 13 courses in six months around the world in 2016 on that Rex tour. And that was amazing as mm. an experience. It was amazing. Um, and then it was hard because we did, you know, pretty well back to back 10 yeah. day, no Extend. breaks. Yeah. Yeah. It was full on and ca- catering as well, often. Yeah. Right. Um, so I do all of that. And then that. Then I did, came back home in 20, at the end of 2016. And I thought, well, should probably do. Oh, that's right. We moved back home because my wife's mother was. Um, we took on her care, mm. and we lived with her for two years. And so I thought, well, how, what, how am I going to? I can't go around the world <laughs> doing anything. So I went online and sort of transferred that online, and off it went from there. So it's always been that sort of way, Charlie. You know, you sort of respond to the. That's what I mean. The diversity of things that get thrown at you. Humans are incredibly adaptive, adaptive. creatures. If yeah. you allow yourself to be, if you give yourself again. Trust your own nature, Mm. as it were. We look at that as an overriding theme that I'd probably like to carry through here is that, uh, you know, you perhaps need to trust yourself and Mm. agree that you're not too bad um, and that you've got, if you don't know already, you do actually have an enormous array of capabilities that um, you may need to express a bit better. As I say, there's um, success or luck or whatever word you want to put there is the Mm -hmm. confluence of preparation and opportunity, you know. And um, there is endless opportunity sure. if, we, if we if we know where to look and if we're prepared to to take that on. And I think um, 
you know, the way you put all these things together into and given people, I guess, the opportunity to learn these things mm. and then adapt it to their farm, I think that's a wonderful thing. They can go to Regrarian's website yeah. to, to, to check Yeah, they out. can do all that. I mean, I think the great thing about – I think my end game with this, is, if, as it were, is – what we've created in our digital network, which is called the Regrarian's Workplace, um, which is amazing um, in itself, is, I mean, I, I kind of you know, like the American concept of a barn raising, um, that a farm plan is actually best done by peers yeah. um, with someone or a framework. And this is, like I say, you know, my, I think my, where I'm at at the moment is the Regrarian's platform is, is a framework mm. Um, to help, but it's a framework of many other frameworks. You can go in there. Yeah, it go. You've got an A to Z, which helps with a lot of way that a lot of people think because you know they want to. Yep, it's linear. It's lineal yep. as thinking, but you can pick and choose. But you can self determine with some with with the help of a buddy, mm. um, someone else who's been out there. Because there's always someone who's a year ahead of you, and there's always someone who's thirty years ahead of totally. you. And that's really, I love the thing about the Regrarian's Workplace that we've got people like that because yeah, it's useful. Like it a lot of this space is dominated by people who are 30 years ahead of you mm. and they don't necessarily remember what it was like. And def- and, and their context then is very different. Like mm. if you started in 1980, the rules of the game in 1980 were vastly different to the rules of the game now. Totally. So it's often useful to have someone who's just a year or two ahead of you, I reckon, mm. um, with with the others so we've created that space such that the farm because i don't see that the farm plan is something that you can do in five minutes it's something that you that is going to have to be uh something that you do over your lifetime it evolves it evolves it has to which is the savory thing the biggest thing that i probably got from the holistic management framework was um the in the feedback loop you plan assuming you're wrong when it comes to the environment, mm. which is a statement around there are no laws of biology, so therefore <laughs> it's Look too out. complex yeah. for you to even contemplate. That said, don't suffer inertia. you still got to move ahead. Yeah. Um, and there's some reli- relatively reliable treatment and management options which are there for you to use. So how about you do some of those? Like move your animals more frequently. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Um, try and cover your soils try and increase landscape or ecological function, try and increase biodiversity, um, try, try and be a better person. Um, Mate, I'm just looking at my little yeah, I can ticking, see that thing, too. ticking over. Yeah, She's gone red. Now, one last quick one. Um, if you could put a billboard on the side of the Hume Highway or whatever the mm-hmm. colder hot, hot freeway is out mm-hmm. here and mm-hmm. said something, what would it say that people mm-hmm. could read? Well, the first thing, that, um, phrase, question, statement. Okay, it would be topsoil formation is the most important outcome of human civilization. Leave it at that. Mate, that's good enough for me. Yeah. Daz, we might have to split this one. We're over the two hour limit. Yeah. And my little red card's going, oh, I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure your um, dedicated and Listeners. experienced team <laughs> of thousands no, of, I don't. of, of, we of don't, your crew. We don't edit a thing, mate. This well, is this is this is well, they're all the people that I mean you can't just bring thirty people to our restaurant like that. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we fed them all. Oh, you have. It's you've amazing. Got, you've got this bloke carrying tape around, and another bloke doing this. And, I know. Yeah. It's like, where's my coffee? Your PA has been knocking on the door, and her PA has <laughs> been doing it. the same. I need my nap now. Where's yeah. my van? Yeah, um, mate, that was fantastic, and I was not surprised that we did we busted the two hour limit. Mm. Um, mm. And appreciate so much your time, Daz, and and thank Please. you for inspiring. You got enough time for a few? Not just me. Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Um, be rude not to. Um, thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for inspiring others, and 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 giving them the opportunity to expand their um, their their opportunities. Yeah, because that's what you're doing, well, and, same, and you've been able to you. put it together in such a wonderful way and on many different levels. Yeah, mate, well, we'll keep at it. Thanks, mate. Thanks don't, for don't, the opportunity, and, and don't stop, mate. Keep doing. Oh no, there's no choice there. Um, you know. No, no choice there. Don't pull up stumps. No, as we say, we're doing it for life. <laughs> we're <laughs> committed. Lifers. <laughs> Lifers. <laughs> as long as we have a pulse. Yeah. Thanks, well, Des. It's all about life. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. 
Well, there you go. What a wonderful opportunity it was to catch up with Darren there at Creamtown in, in Castle, Maine. Um, uh, and just one of the many wonderful guests we've had on in the last season. This is the final episode for season three. We're going to have a bit of a break. Well earned, I trust, break, um, over the next little while. I just want to say a big shout out to all our guests who've um, taken the time to share their stories with us and been so honest and transparent and it's certainly given the feedback we're getting um, resonating um, incredibly well with our listeners. Um, Reese, big shout out to you um, who is our um, editing producing um, uh, man extraordinaire who puts up with um, me putting things like this one in. This uh, little audio is you know, late. Um, I'm not a good student, um, but he's very patient, does an amazing job. And uh, Larissa, big shout out to you. Fiona, your um, pa- <laughs> patience with me as well is fantastic. Um, Fiona being our brand and, and business manager um, developer, management developer, and um, she's been fantastic with, with us for Oh, 18 months, more, more, more than 18 months now. Um, f- so thank you, Fiona, for your, your help during the last, um, the last season. Angelica and my family for being patient with me. It does take a fair bit of time being away from family to be, um, roving around the neighborhood and, and the, and the country, um, capturing these stories. So Angelica, thank you for your patience. Um, well, and, and our listeners, um, big thank you to all of you. If, if, you know, <laughs> If you weren't bothering to put your headphones in and and subscribing and 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 listening to our show every every week, then um, there'd be no point doing it. And you know the feedback we get is amazing. It's um, uh, very humbling when um, you know you get feedback that that references um, that it's you know life changing. Some of the stories they're hearing and they can re- they can resonate with them. And there's parallels with their own story. And even those who Whose, um, whose stories are very different from those of the listeners, that there's always something that you can take away. Some lessons that the, that the, that the guests have learnt that they can share and, or even just parallels in their life. So, you know, the, again, the feedback is, is, is really, um, it's lovely to hear and it sort of keeps us going, to be honest, because it's, it's, it makes it all worthwhile. It, it's not that it's a real chore. It's, um, it can be, um, uh, challenging to get around to, to do these interviews sometimes and line people up and there's a bit of, bit of, bit of stuff going on behind the scenes of the production and so on. But, um, when you get some wonderful testimonials and, and, and just, just lovely comments back, it um, certainly makes it worthwhile and, and, and it gives us, you know, certainly the, not the impression. I think it really does, um, highlight the, the importance of these sort of podcasts that, that, that people can, you know, they can't get on farm. They can't actually talk to all these other these other, other farmers and guests. But if they can hear about it, and the interesting thing is, David Marsh mentioned this the other day, and it was was a great insight. Was you know, for people thinking of transitioning, you know, and, or, or just thinking, oh, maybe it's another way to do it. Or I've heard about this podcast, or you know, like wanting to sort of you know, look at other information. Then, um, then podcasts are fantastic. Going, going to a conference can often be quite daunting. Um, you know, you're seen by your mates there. They're wondering why you're there. You know, it's sort of you, you're much more um, anonymous. Um, and no one needs to know that you're listening to podcasts. If 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 that's a comfortable way to start digesting and ruminating on on new information. So good insight there, David. Um, so maybe there's a lesson there, or 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 an action that um, you know, if you know of anyone who's who's thinking about changing, or you think might like to change, um, maybe give them a gent- gentle prod and flick them the. The link to the to the show and um, any any particular uh, interviews that you that resonate with you, flick them their way. Um, and I hope I'm, I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, certainly, um, our raving, screaming, mad fans um, and our our team on the Patreon um, platform. Thank you so much for your um, your contributions every month. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your wonderful comments. Thank you for joining us on our monthly webinars. Um, we really, really appreciate you because you don't have to do that. You know, anyone can pick up a, uh, a phone and, and um, jump on a podcast and it's free and that's wonderful they can do that. And um, But for you guys who've, who've actually bothered to, you know, jump on our platform and, and become members and support us every month, it's what keeps the uh, the podcast going. And um, we hope to grow that membership um, and, and give you even more sort of um, – 
uh, not so like well, I guess they're member benefits, but but other other things we can we can send your way and, and have you involved in. So we've got a few ideas there we're going to explore in the next few months while we're on a break. Please keep sending in any suggestions you might have for people to um, to interview. We've got a long list, so it's not as though we need to, but we're always interested in, in knowing. Um, yeah, who's about? <clears throat> excuse me, who's about? And um, especially if I'm when I'm travelling, if there's people I can sort of interview on my way, that's always a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone there. Um, thank you, everyone, for the season three. Um, please don't stop. You know, don't resist the urge to keep listening, um, sending the um, your favourite interviews to other people, spreading the news, and um, and let's uh, let's um, you know keep the keep the good the good stuff going and, and spreading the love about um, regenerative not just regenerative agriculture it's about regenerative living and uh, a different way of life um, there you go season three done and dusted um, thank you everyone again and uh, can't wait to share some of the um, the people we've got lined up for um, season season four actually well I can why don't I do that now if I remember them um, Tammy Jonas from Jono Farm we've got uh, Maggie Beer um, Rebecca Sullivan um, down there in South Australia. Um, uh, and anyway, there's, there's plenty more in the can. Just a few to dangle the carrot with. And um, we'll see you in season four. Cheerio. This podcast is produced by Reese Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.